Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the GT World Challenge Esports Europe Endurance Series here at the beautiful Monza Grand Prix circuit. My name is Paul Jeffrey, and I am delighted to be calling the action once again alongside Mr. Lewis McGlade. Lewis, how are you today, sir? I am absolutely fantastic. I hope you are as well. What a day of action we have got ahead of us. A three-hour race around the Temple of Speed. It is going to be an absolute thriller. Yep, really is. Monza is a beautiful venue in which to host GT racing and a three-hour endurance is what we've got in store for us today. This is, ladies and gents, our home, the first of the endurance series racers in the SRO eSport competition series. And it's going to throw up one or two little differences to what we've seen so far. So far in this championship, in America, in Asia, in Europe, and even in Britain, we've had 60-minute races. And Lewis, three hours, an entirely different experience for our drivers to get through. Yeah, of course. To, to today, uh, rather, two cars, uh, two drivers per car to make things a little bit spicy. We can see who's on screen at the moment. So you've got the likes of Martin Kronker on the left-hand side of your screen. We'll get more on him. You've got Yigor Rognikov. You've got Josh Rogers coming in from the Coanda Sim House, as well as plenty of other big names in motorsport. Ross McGregor, uh, uh, Luca Burke, Eamon Murphy. What a fantastic group of names that are going to be battling it out. And trust me, it is going to be a tight tussle over the three-hour race if yesterday's 60 minute sprint race around the circuit is anything to go by. Well, I think you touched on something very interesting there. Of course, we did the sprint series opening round yesterday, same circuit in the GT3 classification cars, and the racing was absolutely sensational. We had a fabulous lineup of drivers, many of whom are also taking part in the race today. And as Louis said, this is a driver swap affair. Here are a few of those names that we're talking about. So Williams Esports represented by Tarek Gamel and Jack Keithley. Tarek Gamel, a new sign into the Williams Esports team. Lucas Muller and Ben Hitz for the Hapt Racing Team Scheidler Mercedes AMG team. Another pairing that we should see very much at the front of the field. Josh Rogers, somebody that we saw from Coanda Simsport once again rocking the Porsche 911 GT3R as a driver very much at the peak of his powers very powerful in i racing and very fast in the race yesterday as well samir ibrahimi that many will recognize from the sro esports and championship lines up with chris herker in the gpix racing by ren welton porsche so another driver well worth watching out for camel pavloski danilo santoro for jean alacy esports two very quick drivers camel pavloski of course one of the stars of sro esport competition back in the very first season in 2019 so pavloski had a a little bit of a uh, subdued performance in recent races in SRO eSport competition. So looking forward to see what they can do in the John Lacey eSports Academy. Ferrari 488 GT3 Evo. Ferrado, Sorello, Chris Hartfeld lining up alongside Marco Murray and Dennis Schrodinger as well, respectively, for Mercedes and Porsche. Another two very, very big names, very fast drivers indeed. And yesterday's winner, spoiler alert for anybody who's not watched the race yet, I'm sorry, David Tanitza for the FD East Ferrari Driver Academy esports team. And of course, a Ferrari 488 GT3 Evo lines up alongside his new teammate, Giovanni Di Salvo, winner of the 2020 Ferrari Driver Academy Championship. So that's a car, no doubt, we're going to be speaking a lot about over the course of this five-round season. Nilly Nowiox and Arthur Camera for BMW Motorsport Sim Racing G2 Esports in the big BMW M6 GT3. They had a hard day yesterday in the sprint series, but still secured a rostrum finish. So another driver that may be struggling a little bit with pace in that BMW, but we'll see some wily racing and some great strategy. I am absolutely sure to get them further up the field. Martin Kronka, VRS Kwanda Sim Sport that we've already spoken about. A very, very powerful sim racing team should do well as well in this field. And We've got an incredible, absolutely incredible lineup of drivers. Angus Fender, real world driver in British GT4 in the BS competition BMW team in the M6 alongside Attila Denk. So that's another driver we should keep our eyes out for over the course of the next three hours or so. Alberto Garcia as well in the Odox Motorsport Audi. Another driver we'll have seen plenty of in esport competition 
in the world of Assetto Corsa Competizione. Staying with Michael Tauscher alongside George Bouvet in the side, Max Motorsport, Aston Martin. As you can see already, the theme running through this grid is incredible talent, isn't it, Lewis? All the way through. Yeah, from the front to the back, believe me, to get on the grid, you have to be talented, you have to be fast. And then if you want to contend for victories, for podiums, potentially even for the championship, by the time we reach the final round, you have to be the very best of the very best. Not only that, you've got to be teamed up with the very best of the very best. You're only as strong as your weakest driver in this sense. And how things work today when it comes to that uh, uh, strategy and, and format is over the three-hour race, we've got uh, a... a a mandatory pit window, not window, but they say, but you, you can't, can't maximize past a 65 minute stint, which means that you've got to come in twice. Uh, one driver can not exceed 130 minutes in the car, which is fine if you reach in the 65 minute um, windows, because uh, that is 130, uh, if you do your math right. But it's going to be a little bit tricky as to, you know, when you decide to pick your way into it, because you've, you've got those certain periods, you need to take advantage of them very, very well, get out of traffic and get racing hard. Yeah, strategy is going to play a very important role in this race. You'll have an idea, I would imagine, going into the event, what you want to do, how you expect your event to pan out. But it all depends, doesn't it, on what the track conditions are like at any given time, where you are in comparison to other cars on the circuit. Are you being held up? Are you carrying a good speed at that moment in time? And what the fuel economy is like on each car? Because don't forget... This is a three-hour race, so we're going to be burning fuel, and cars burn fuels at different rate. Can you eke it out for an extra lap in your stint? Will you have to short fuel and come in early? How will that work in terms of your stint dynamics, and which driver do you want in the car at any given time? And I think, Lewis, that's going to be one of the fascinating talking points, isn't it, during the course of this race for us? Yeah, 100%. If your car's struggled in qualifying, especially around this kind of circuit, it is a track that you can work your way forwards, especially if you can extend the fuel mileage uh, of the car. Speak of things like the uh, Bentleys and stuff like that. They may be able to just stretch the fuel mileage a little bit. I think 65 minutes, though, with the way these uh, these cars are, most of the cars should be able to hit that 65-minute uh, 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 stint time bang on with no real issue. Uh, but you've got some cars on the grid that really do need the perfect kind of race. And when I mean cars, I mean actual cars not teams not drivers i mean cars aston martins do not look particularly fast around here uh as we were quite uh, uh viewing on yesterday they need to move forward they need a perfect race they do they need to make the most of the slipstream they need to make the most of the action that's going on around and there's 34 cars on the grid for this race don't forget so monza is a very quick circuit traffic will play into the uh way that the race unfolds over the course of the next three hours and with as we say the varying pit strategies that may come into play there are going to be cars out of position at any given time during the race and how they deal with racing alongside or in the middle of a pack of cars that speed wise they're maybe not naturally expecting to be alongside that's going to be a very big important thing there's a famous saying the motor racing to win a motor race is not about how fast you can go it's about how few mistakes you can make and i think that's never going to be truer than here today for this opening race yeah it certainly was when it came to strategy for kevin siggy it seemed yesterday in that fantastic three-way fight whether we'll see the same kind of things unfold today we'll have to wait and see uh i i kind of get the the vibe though that things are going to unfold a little bit dramatically into detail it's, it's monza you know that run into the retifilio for the first time it's, it's a 34-car grid. It could be a little bit dicey. And it, like you say, avoiding those mistakes, keeping out of trouble, even if you're 34th, if you keep out of trouble through Turn 1, you're fine. Yeah, but we spoke about that actually yesterday as well. Turn 1 and then the second chicane as well, the uh, Variante Bassa, both very, very much a pinch point, a danger zone for the drivers. And you almost want to be either at the front or right at the very back. If you're in the middle, you've got yourself and the cars in ahead of you and the cars behind you to contend with. And it's very easy to get caught up in somebody else's mistake. And although three hours is a relatively long amount of time, the level of speed across the grid that we've seen, it's very difficult to make up even a few tenths of a second that you've lost to your immediate rivals, isn't it? Yeah, well, a three-hour race, 60-minute stints, roughly, uh, which means when we're driving with, we've got two drivers, you've got to be picking up, one driver's doing two hours, basically, so it's going to be hard work for them, and it has to be perfection. 
Yep, so let's have a look at the grid. So it's Martin Kronke in pole position in the number 88 alongside the Koana Sim Sport car of Josh Rogers. So a Porsche 1-2 on the grid. In third position is our winner from yesterday, David Tanitsa for the Ferrari Driver Academy team. Alongside him is Eamon Murphy in the McLaren 720S, the fastest of the McLaren 720S as we've seen Chris Herker in fourth position that we've just overrun. Gronwald in sixth position for the number 14 Mercedes and like Lining up in seventh place is Mike Noble in the Lamborghini. Great performance from the Lamborghini there. Carol Pavlovsky alongside in the Ferrari GTE Evo. Nils Naujox is ninth position for BMW. And alongside him is Attila Denks in the number 89 Beamer. Chris Hartveld is 11th place in yet another Porsche. So watch out for them moving their way through the field. And then the 720 McLaren of Nowoski in 12th place, Lucas Muller in 13th position and Luca Burke good performance there in the 720s number 22 McLaren to get 14th on the grid Giantara is 15th position in yet another Lamborghini so Lamborghini looking quite strong today Pfeiffer in 16th position for the Audi and in 17th place is the Bentley Continental GT3 of Kevin Ciclari yeah, back from that, we've got the 192 Ferrari Blotto behind the wheel in qualifying. Be disappointed with 18th position. And then DV1 Triton in that Lamborghini. Uh, that's Dominic Blyer and Tauskovic who are going to be qualifying just outside, the t uh, just inside rather, the top 20. They'll need to work their way forward. The number 33 Mercedes, Triello, was behind the wheel in that session. And then Egger behind the wheel of the Lamborghini that is in 21st position. Miato directly alongside the Aston Martins that we think might struggle through the race here. Van der Velde with Kreutzer in the Ferrari that's going to be starting from 23rd position, that number 97. On the right-hand side of your screen, you've got the number 96. Keep your eye on that one to march forward. Tauscher qualified it. Boothby going to be in the car a bit later. Two incredibly fast drivers. The 66 Lexus that's got Pivot behind the wheel uh, alongside Jack Keithley in the AMR uh, V8 Vantage. Jack Keithley for Williams Esports. The number 41, Yigor Ogorognikov. Big fan base out in chat, I'm sure, as we've got Ross McGregor as well for the Jota Sports squad starting uh, a little bit disappointingly from 28th position somewhere towards the back but I'm sure we'll march forward uh, Garcia from 29th position and Masood uh, from 30th then the rest of the grid will be Staffin, Bridport, uh, Craner and Benzes on this 34 car grid anyone back here they are going to be looking to just stay out of trouble on that march to turn one but it's so easy don't you think to just be lulled into it a touch and just think ah oh, I could just send it a little bit couldn't I <laughs> yes, exactly. As always in Monza, the first lap, first corner will be critical for each and every one of these drivers. Now, here's a fun fact before we get started. Pole position today is the exact same lap time as pole position yesterday for the sprint series. So, different day, different conditions, different drivers, different cars, and the lap time is identical between both races. So, you couldn't make it up incredibly, incredibly close. A very small split between the entire grid as well actually i've been looking at the uh, final place on the grid 1.6 seconds away from pole position so we're uh, i think we're lining up another rather spectacular event indeed is about to unfold yeah, in a three-hour race, you can definitely see people march forward. And uh, the race is up for grabs genuinely for any one of the 34 competitors on the grid. You can really see it that open with 30 seconds before we get the formation lap underway. Uh, just want to say, I mean, fa it is fantastic to see VRS Coanda Simsport in uh, set a course of competency only. I know they're fairly new to it. Um, for anyone who's watched sim racing for the last few years, you'll know they are one of the biggest teams uh, across sim racing as a whole, now making the step over to a set of course of competency only. What a start for them to be lining up one and two at the moment. Although I will say I am actually surprised it's that way around. Martin Kronka ahead of Josh Rogers. Yeah, great performance by Kronker, obviously. Uh, Josh Rogers finished second yesterday in the Sprint Series, so he's got some good experience of this track, of this championship and style of racing, but qualifying, yes, very important. Get a good grid slot, always important in motor racing, no matter what event it is. But a three-hour race, maybe not as critical as we've seen in other championships. But one thing to note, Lewis, yesterday I spotted the Porsche not quite as uh, sharp in a straight line. As some of the other cars so that'll be interesting to see how that unfolds 
Certainly will be. It was a bit of a, a, a shock on that run down into uh, the Retifilio on the very first time when Tanitza from pole position, just to give you a little bit of an update as to what happened yesterday, uh, Tanitza dropped backwards a little bit. I think it was down to about third position and went into some proper combat with himself, Josh Rogers uh, and Kevin Siggy, who were a part of that. Kevin Siggy not racing today. Let's get Team Red line on the grid one day. Uh, certainly not this season, but uh, what a fantastic team it was and what time to see them all battling it out to the real heavy rates team wise uh, in sim racing, going toe to toe with Tanitza getting very much involved, a driver who has fantastic form in sim racing. But yeah, moved backwards, as did his teammate, uh, at least in this event, and of course yesterday, uh, De Salvo. They both dropped backwards. Then they used that that grunt of the Ferrari to move back forwards. That's why I think Tanitza is going to be on the attack very early. He wants to rectify the mistakes of a poor start yesterday and use the advantage of this Ferrari, which seems to be pretty pokey. Yeah, it's a great aerodynamic shape, which obviously is very, very important here at Monza. The Ferrari, very much a car that is an overtaking, has you the ability to overtake, should I say, in the Ferrari. The Porsches were quick over the lap time, but a little bit slower in a straight line. So that'd be fascinating to see how that unfolds. But David Tanitza, very experienced driver, as you say, former F1 Esports world champion as well, Ferrari driver, academy driver. He's got enough race intelligence to know that you don't need to go all in in the very early stages. We saw that yesterday as well, just hanging back, seeing what happens in front of him, biding his time, taking the opportunities when they present themselves. And that's again going to be another important skill, I think, Lewis, today, isn't it? To, to know when it's appropriate to attack and when it's appropriate to consolidate. So one thing that I've noticed with uh, a set of course of competition is we've got a lot of young drivers coming up through the scenes. You know, um, think of uh, Tobias Fether uh, on the, the grid today. I can't remember where he's qualified, but he's, uh, I think he's like 14. Dennis Schoeniger's also around the same kind of area, like 14 or 15 uh, years of age. Lots of young drivers in sim racing. And what that kind of means is like, to, to use what you were saying there, maybe a little bit of an experience in racecraft positions. And like you say, to, to really extend yourself in a three hour race, it's a about patience, it's about time, it's about knowing when and where to attack. And those younger drivers may be not too in tune with uh, with 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 when and where. Got to ask a question before we get to the before you call the race start, of course. Uh, who's going to win? <laughs> you know, I've got to do it. Got to do it. I'm going to give the same answer that I always give to that question. <laughs> I will come back to you at the end of the race with my response. I, it could be anybody. The grid is so tight, Louis. It could literally pick a name put a pin in it that could be your race winner i'm getting the vibe i'm gonna go for it i'm not gonna go with the rs commander who are on that front row i am getting a vibe about that ferrari directly behind them tanitza winner yesterday and the salvo alongside who got up to fourth position in yesterday's race i think they are going to come out on top but they have got some proper heavyweights to take on here in the opening round of the season at monza Yep, so whoever wins at the end of this race will be the deserving winner because this is a fabulous grid. A great idea to have a three-hour endurance race. The first race of five this season as well. Don't forget today we're in Monza. Next time out we'll be at Paul Ricard for a six-hour spectacular. But this man, Josh Rogers, for the VRS Coanda Porsche team, second on the grid, lying in his way down the start-finish straight, looking to the gantry to his right-hand side for those red lights to turn green to try and get the jump over his teammate Martin Kronke in the number 88 similar livery Porsche to the left hand side the green flag falls the cars accelerate their way down to the Retifilio chicane for the first time at the GT World Challenge Esport Europe endurance season everybody's fanning out at the back of the field trying to find a little bit of real estate to insert their car in watch out into the first left at right and left, avoid contact, try and keep it nice and clean. Everybody seems to be doing a little bit of checking up further down the running Ooh. order. A little bit of a tangent effect there, but everybody just about survives. We see a car sideways right at the very back of the grid. So the final two runners delaying themselves, but Josh Rogers is our race leader. So Rogers achieves what he wanted to achieve, gets the jump off the start, and is the early race lead. And further back, David Tanitza now under pressure as well for third position. Can the Ferrari man hold on? We will find out, but a relatively clean start up at the front of the field. Yeah, I think Abrami got by coming down, uh, or rather on the exit of the Retifilio. This is back with Capoccia going side by side with Gronovold in the Unicorns of Love car against the Yaz Heat squad. Uh, no Yaroslav Honzik behind the wheel of Yaz Heat. It is Capoccia and Eamon Murphy. And firing through all of this, the 80 Lamborghini of Noble, who might get it done on both of them on the run to, uh, to Ascari. God, you want to know a car that's quick in a straight line? Pick that Lambo out. 
<laughs> Fantastic stuff, packed racing, and it's very, very best indeed. We're looking at Grongwald now there, in a little picture in picture, trying to keep his car out of trouble and make his way up the running order. This is Yiga Rognikov in the number 41 Aston Martin. We suggested that the Aston Martin is maybe struggling for ultimate pace so far. Ooh, There's the McLaren off on the grass at the side of the racetrack. We'll check out who that is in a little while. Another car going wide and mowing the load as well. So a little bit of contact further up the running order, but Rodnikov now down the inside into the parabolic in the inside of the Audi alongside him, secures the position. Igor Rodnikov up one place into 26th. I believe that uh, 720, it was the, uh, the, the, the 720 was the 720, the Carbon Simsport one that was off on the exit of uh, Mascari, uh, uh, being told that it was contact with himself and Ross McGregor has a lot of damage on the Jota Simsport car uh, as we're watching running through the uh, first chicane, it's Attila Dench in that beautiful liveried uh, BS competition car, one of the uh, official BMW squads along with the likes of G2 Esports and Williams as well, although Williams driving at Aston Martin, Let's won't get into the politics behind all that stuff, but very, very complicated stuff behind the scenes even in sim racing. Yeah, it is indeed, Attila Dench now on the defensive from the Porsche, last of the late breakers just behind and manages to get past as well, so great overtaking manoeuvre from the Porsche, Attila will have had no idea what was happening then when the Porsche stormed around the outside and now he's under pressure from Luca Burke in the McLaren 720S, so Attila Dench going backwards very, very quickly, dropping outside of the top 10 positions in 12th place and Luca Burke tried everything in the book and more to find a way past that big BMW. Yeah, surprising to see the BMW just not being as fast in a straight line as back aboard with Gronovold makes contact with the rear end of Noble as they're both off the road. Ascari, that was just overdone a little bit from the Unicorns of Love Man. He's going to have to go around the outside at Parabolica, but the harder they fight, the more that Santoro might be a part of this for the John Lacey Esports Academy squad. Uh, keep your eye out on that. I did see that Luke Burke was under a lot of pressure from the 157 car of Simonini, who desperately wants to get up to his teammate of Dennis Schoeniger, who's just a bit further up the order. There is Simonini. Uh, you can see there on the livery, uh, it's, it's a Predator by RHG car, but normally the livery, you'd kind of be more associated with the RHG Esports squad. That one being the squad of one Mr. Roman Grosjean. They do have the Porsche of Dennis Schoeniger, who's normally a WPS driver, but over in that squad for this evening's racing and the season as well. Yep, Simonini having a good drive so far, 14th position on the defensive from Sicolari in the big Bentley Continental GT3 behind. So Sicolari at this moment in time, Ooh. he needs to find as one of the Lamborghinis, goes dress tracking as well, further down the running order. So Lamborghini, faster than expected, I think that might have been Dominic Blyer that was uh, running wide at the chicane faster than we've seen them in a long time in SRO competition but at the moment the drivers having a lot of difficulty keeping them on the grey stuff and that is uh, not something you can keep up over three hours or it'll start to bite you quite significantly as the race progresses. Yeah absolutely uh, you've got to be a bit bit more cautious in the early stages but these drivers driving like it is a 16 minute sprint race uh, these two may look like they're in fairly similar colours most certainly not teammates we've got the Yaz Heat car of Capoccia directly on screen and ahead of him is Santoro directly behind is Niels Nyox who is a driver who is certainly not afraid to get on the attack did well yesterday uh, to march his way up the order from memory onto the podium as we've got Ontari who's uh, on Arati rather who's off the road at Lesmo 2. Yeah, very easy mistake to make for an Arati there. Just run a little bit wide, ran out of real estate, and then away he goes, lucky to keep the car facing the right direction. But look at this fight now. We've got Masood in the Audi R8 at the front of the pack, 26 position at the moment for Masood in the Team WRT car. But behind him, we've got an Aston Martin, we've got a Honda in the mix as well, the Ferrari that we just saw off the racetrack, and a couple of McLarens for good measure. And just like with Cub, to expect from Monza, even though this is only, with, only even though this is a three-hour endurance race, the fight in the slipstream in the battle is intense as you like. As we're looking now on board, Ken Ciclari running down the start-finish straight, coming into the Retifilio chicane. Simeone on the defensive, immediately in the R8 Audi. Can he catch it on the brakes? Yes, he can. The Audi has the racing line, has track position. Nowhere for Ciclari to go in the Bentley, and now because he's made that manoeuvre and not pulled it off, he comes under pressure from the chasing car behind, which is exactly what we see here at Monza. If you don't succeed in your overtaking manoeuvre, immediately you are under pressure from the chasing driver. Great stuff so far.
Yeah, speaking of under pressure, we've got Luca Berka Tilla Dench battling it out for 12th position at the moment. Simonini, as you said before, if you don't complete that move, you're under pressure, and that is exactly what's happened here. Luca Burke not able to pass the BMW uh, of Attila Dench and Simonini right over the rear end, and then once again to Clary, who has started to get used to uh, that Bentley. I've seen them driving it quite a lot for uh, racing my motorsport, very much uh, a car you get accustomed with. And that's the thing is that all these cars do drive differently. They, they may all be part of the same category, they may all be part of the same uh, race, but they are very, very different, uh, whether it's front, rear, mid, long, uh, short, whatever. Like they are all different in their own right. And some drivers really do balance better with some cars than others. Yeah, it's all about the driving the style of the driver versus the car, the setup that you've got on board as well, and there's a custom balance of performance in play within this championship as well that'll be reviewed on a round-by-round -round basis, manufacturer-by-manufacturer manufacturer basis, but it seems to be favouring the Porsches and the Ferraris at this stage in the proceedings. We're looking now at Siriello in 20th position, just getting overtaken by, I believe that is Matthias Egger, is it? No, it's not. It is Van der Velde. So Van der Velde moves up to 19th. Ciriello, 20th place at the moment, heading down into T1 again. Can he get the place back in the grunt and go Mercedes? It's very much in the slipstream. The inside line has not been defended by the Ferrari ahead, but not quite close enough to get along side and snatch the position on the brakes as we see another position change a little bit of a kiss Ooh. door to door further back in your shot but everybody survives and lives to fight another day yeah that was Tausha skipping over you've got Yiga Rog Rognikov and uh, Tausha two drivers who uh, are incredibly fast it it's just this this kind of shows that the Aston Martins really do not favor this circuit at the moment because these two uh, you, you'd be hard pressed to see them down towards the back of the field. You'd normally expect them to both be towards the front. The Side Max Motorworks squad that's currently on screen are, uh, are very much becoming a, a very, very strong uh, team. And of course, with George Boothby in the squad, uh, very, very strong indeed. Igor Rogorognikov, though, uh, teammates with Grabowski, those two normally partner up in the uh, Lada Sport Rosenef's team, but uh, uh, slight changes today. They're in a Simware.pro car, uh, still effectively the same like outfit, the same drivers, etc. Just a, a slightly different livery on side the vehicle. And you can see there, oh, did you see that Tonitsa? He is getting very, very close to the back of Kronker, who's dropping off from Rogers quite a bit here. And this is almost a carbon copy of what we saw yesterday for the Sprint Series race. Tanitsa, early stages of the event, running down in third position, looking a little bit short of lap time compared to his rivals, but it's just playing the strategic game as we look at David Tanitsa now in the picture, in picture. Marinello at the Ferrari HQ racing away in the FDA eSports team, the Ferrari Driver Academy eSports team, just taking his time, bringing the car in, making sure the tyres are in nice condition, making sure he's not making any mistakes, not doing anything unnecessary at this stage in the race. But he'll be conscious, won't he, that Josh Rogers, at the head of the field, is starting to gap his VRS Coanda teammate. So he needs to make a move does the Ferrari driver David Tanitza, otherwise he's going to start getting a little bit disconnected and making his life all the more hard for the race victory come the chequered flag in two hours and 50 minutes time. Tausch have been passed then by Yiga Rognikov as they go side by side a little bit through Curva Grande being covered off by the young Russian before they reach uh, the Della Roger chicane and now the Audi behind of Masood fancies his way through in the entire scenario but I think it might actually go and complete the way of the Russian Tauscher potentially going to be passed by the Audi this is going to be tight as he's trying to cover it off Masood doesn't fancy that at all as he commits to the inside at Lesmo 1 it doesn't matter whether it was a fight at the front of the field or towards the back they will fight as hard as they want and that was pretty tight stuff indeed nicely fended off by Tauscher but for David Tanitza by the the way anyone who said back in the day ah oh, well you know he's uh he's just a an f1 esports driver he's not you know he, he's good in that but you give him a sim you give him an actual car and maybe not so much cancel that ladies and gentlemen because boy is he fast yeah fabulous driver is david tenitzer of course he'll be handing the car over to his fda teammate gianni de salvo a little bit later in the race another incredibly quick driver ferrari esports series reigning champion new ferrari driver academy racer as well so it'll be fascinating to see how de salvo gets on finish fourth or fifth i can't quite remember now yesterday if memory serves me correct but tenitzer on the attack using the slippery lines of that 488 gt3 evo to try and get up to the rear of 
Kroger's Porsche ahead, not quite enough on the last lap, but Tanitza now very much on his toes as Simeone in the heat of battle as well, surrounded by Lamborghinis. Oh. Here's Giorgio Simeone makes contact with one of them as well. The other one goes flying over the sleeping policeman, but Simeone retains his position in 15th place in the Audi, but the, no doubt the stewards will be looking at that one again to see if that contact could have been avoided. Yeah, I think it was just where you had uh, Egger smash into the back of Blyer, Blyer then into uh, Simonini, and then Simonini into the back of Giranato. And yeah, just went for a spin. There is Dominic Blyer at the moment for DV1 Triton. Uh, uh, so I've normally commented on them racing around in a uh, Bentley. They seem to be fairly comfortable in the uh, black and light blue. Uh, of the Lamborghini. You've got Van der Velzer as well behind for the Side Max Motorworks squad. He was nearly able to take advantage in all that scenario. And here we go, battle for second, getting very tight. Yeah, David Tenitson now very much thinking this is the time to go forward as we're coming through the very high speed of Scar as she came for the run down onto the back straight into the final corner of the curve, a parabolic of the Porsche gets a little bit of a better run through the chicane courtesy of having clean air ahead of him David Tenitson falls back a few paces starts to make it again in straight line speed but coming from too far back at this stage in the race trying to get through the curve of parabolic and nice and cleanly onto the throttle as early as he possibly can to maximize the amount of time in the slipstream of the Porsche behind ahead but compared to yesterday Lewis it looks like that Porsche has been set up with a little bit more straight line speed and that makes it much less vulnerable to being overtaken than we saw yesterday although now Tanitza great run into the braking zone but not quite close enough on this lap at least yeah, did see, by the way, just uh, popping up on the screen there again. It's actually a good point to uh, re-note, and we'll get onto that in just a moment, that um, that the number 14, which is the Unicorns of Love car that is in sixth position, does have a warning. A drive-through penalty has been gifted the way of the 192, which is Blotto and Honorati. Honorati being behind the wheel of the Kessel uh, Racing squad. So they'll get a drive-through. They're already coming in to serve it for contact with the 720. That was the Carbon Simsport cast. That would have been uh, down at Ascari. Remember when we saw that 720? 20 car off the road uh, on the exit of Ascari, so that'll all be a part of that. But 15 minutes into the race, I agree. I think the Porsches are set up a little bit better in a straight line, at least so far what it seems, but they still seem to be lacking, obviously with the slipstream and stuff, they seem to be, seem to be lacking deep in the, the run. It kind of makes you wonder, what if you close the Porsches back up again and then just allow them to slipstream off of each other, in a sense, to defend from the Ferrari behind? Yeah, that's a good strategic call, actually, and something that maybe team manager of that team will be thinking about to tell their drivers because of course folks at home we spoke to uh, David Tanitza about this very subject these drivers aren't out on the circuit all on their own making their own decisions the vast majority of the teams and drivers will have a coach or a driver manager or a strategist in their ear giving them advice feeding them data and information telling them how the race is unfolded as well so this is very much isn't it a team sport there's the driver in the cockpit at any given time they'll be swapping with one of their teammates later on but there's a whole host of activity that goes on behind the scenes as well to get these cars as competitive as they are it really is a replication of real world motorsport as Luca Burke now still under pressure in 13th place yeah, I think it's Jan Polak who might be running things behind the scenes for the Rocket Simsport uh, squad. So speaking of engineers and stuff, as we see Saclari who might try and make a move down into the first chicane at the Retafilio. Should be an easy move from the bend. It's not being covered off by the 720 Rocket Simsport McLaren uh, at the moment. So going to drop back uh, down into 14th position. But yeah, uh, you know, you, you go back three, four years and absolutely it was a, a single drive. You know, you just do your own thing. Whereas these days it is all about your race engineers and how they help Tausher receiving a little bit of contact from the 66 pivot behind the wheel Masu going to try and slip through as well as he's actually pushing the Lexus past yeah <laughs> a bit of bump draft there from Masu ahead of the uh, Lexus ahead of him and that leaves the Aston Martin very much out to dry will become the outside for the chicane can the Aston do it on the braces be careful not to collect the back of the Lexus ahead not quite got enough braking power decides to give up the position on that one and now we've got the very fast charging Terry Gamble in the Williams Esport in the sister Aston Martin oh. almost makes contact does make contact in the right hand the Terry Gamble getting a little bit leery in his desperation to find a way past the Aston ahead he needs to calm it down does Gamble we've still got two hours and 43 minutes left on the clock and that kind of behavior could very very quickly lead to a big accident so Terry Gamble 27th position, trying desperately to make places following a disappointing qualification for the Williams man. 
Yeah, I think it was actually, I think it might have been Keefley in qualifying. I don't fully remember, but either way, uh, they, they started, I believe, from 25th position. So they've dropped back and then worked their way forward. Uh, I believe that might be under investigation. To be fair, I actually think it might have been Tauscher. Because obviously, the, the, the thing is with Lesmo 1, is like you've got a few different lines. Uh, if you're on the inside, you tend to, to brush out courtesy of the Canberra down in the corner, etc. So you may see them rush up the corner. I think that's what we saw from Tauscher. Could potentially see a, I, I think, warning a most. I don't think they'll give anything much more intense as they're you know, still battling half the position but I think it might have been a bit more on Tauscher than Tarek Gamel. Either way, Williams Esportsman was marching through in that scenario and is certainly fancying his way forward but once again, the Aston Martins do very much seem like they are struggling even in the race in this scenario. And something for the folks at home to bear in mind, although Aston Martin, as, as Lewis rightly points out, are struggling a little bit here at Monza, you are... Uh, a site where you stick to the manufacturer on which yeah. you chose at the start so that's the car they'll use throughout the course of a five race season so it's very very important to get in that top 10 to score those championship points to take your championship challenge all the way through the course of the year we're racing for 42 hours over the course of this next five races the three hour at monza today paul ricard june the fifth for six hours the spa 24 hours on august the 7th six hours at the nurburgring and rounding out the season with a three-hour blast at barcelona so there's a lot of racing still to do the drivers are in the championship from the beginning to the end so everything that you can do to score points to learn about your car to find the ways of bringing speed to your particular car that's all going to help as uh, Egger goes to the beach but comes back again decides the weather's not sunny enough to get out the spade and bucket he says it's not sunny enough mate it looks great out there I don't know <laughs> where you are mate but looks fantastic weather out there at the moment at Monza uh, nice and sunny at present but yeah a bit of a mistake there and it allowed the DV1 Triton squad Dominic Blyer through uh, and this is the thing though when it comes to car choice and even excluding uh, uh, balance of performance and stuff, which can switch as we're seeing the Battle Force sixth position as the Jean Lacy Esports Academy squad, Santaro going to go around the outside at the Retifilio, uh, getting past the 14 of Gronovold. That was a sensational move around the outside of the Unicorns of Love, who have been warned to making contact with the uh, number 80. Uh, but yeah, uh, back to the point. Um, it, it's, it's kind of one of those things where you, you pick a car for this circuit, cool, it might work. But even excluding balance of performance, your, your car, like the Porsches are great here. They may really suck eggs through the rest of the season. And that's the difference, right? Is, is you, you pick a car for the season that works for all of the tracks well, not just for one. Yeah, exactly. Again, it's another strategic element, isn't it, for the drivers to take into account. And there's also some, some fluffier strategic side of things that drivers may or may not be as strong on circuit layouts as Mateus Egger once again in the thick of it. Two Lamborghinis followed by a Ferrari. That's a nice sight at Monza, if ever I've seen one. And Mateus Egger, 16th place, holds position just at the moment. Van der Velde in the Ferrari, trying to buy into that fight as well van der velde in the ferrari of number 97 ferrari to keep an eye on him moving forward and trying to buy into this as well as chiriello in the number 33 mercedes amg just starting to close onto the back of this three-way fight to make it a four-way battle for 16th position on the very very limit of adhesion there they are pushing the limit on the exit of Ascari. Just to note that um, track limits and stuff are handled uh, by the simulator itself. So it will take on and uh, take over control in that sense. So whether it's slowdowns, drive panels, whatever it is, the, the simulator takes control of that scenario. So if they're pushing it a little bit too far, believe me, they will be punished for it. As we've got the Ferrari, I, I'd very much keep my eye on that 97 that's just behind me. You know the Lamborghini is a bit pokey on the straight line as Egger did get by Dominic Blyer, but keep your eye on the side Max Motorworks Ferrari that's going to try and get involved in this scenario being covered off by Dominic Blyer as a drive through penalty is dished out to the 129 we'll cover that off in a moment there is contact between DV1 Triton and the 97 going to skip the Retifilio interesting yeah, Van der Velde trying to make his way past and achieving it in the end, but slightly off circuit. So he'll probably do well to give that position back, lest the uh, stewards in this race award a penalty for him. I think he is doing, he's either giving it back or losing track position through racing. Yes, through racing. So Van der Velde retains position over Dominic Blyer in the Lamborghini behind. So he'll have to watch out for that one. The stewards are live stewards as well here in the GT World Challenge Europe 
endurance series. So Van der Velde, very much the man under pressure. Now we're looking at a replay here of one of the Ferraris all the way out on his own, the number 197. Coming through the Ascari chicane, gets a little bit of a wiggle on, goes across that ever popular beach and pirouettes the car. Luckily for him, he's not in close proximity to anybody else, but that was a very Larry moment. And I think he'll have to just take a few moments to bring his heartbeat down a little. Yeah, that was Honorati, who's already been through the pit lane for a drive through penalty in the early stages of the race. The 192 uh, Castle Racing by Racing Line uh, squad uh, did see, by the way, yes, so popping up onto the screen, uh, drive through penalty for contact between car 129 and 33. Uh, very quickly, the 33 being the uh, AKKA ASP by GTWR squad. Um, so they were, they were quite clearly hit off by the 129, the 129 being the Ratten Racing by Clash, one of their cars. So a drive through penalty dished out uh, to the Lamborghini. Yeah, intense stuff already. So we said this is a three hour endurance race and I'm sure the drivers will all take it nice and steady accordingly in the opening portion of the race. And that's been thrown in the dustbin. We're all yeah. driving like it's a touring car race. But great stuff for us at home, great stuff for us in the commentary booth as well. If you are watching at home, hello, thank you for joining in. Don't forget to stay tuned to the GT World YouTube channel. We've got races for the Americas, the Asian series, the European Sprint series, the European Endurance season as well. And of course, the real world GT World Challenge drivers racing for points in the real life championship. So a great channel to be involved in. Do like and subscribe and stay tuned because we've got more serious racing esports than you can shake a stick at coming up this year. Yeah, and fantastic stuff indeed. Can't wait for all of the racing action to see sim racers at their very best because every time we see them race, they reach even loftier heights. Did see there uh, on screen as we've uh, got Dominic Bly, who's now behind uh, Van der Velde, uh, still. Uh, uh, did, was that Van der Velde who switched? So have they switched around? We'll, we'll catch up with race control, will be on them anyway. Um, uh, yeah, well, seeing. Uh, Niels Nyok's there on screen anyway, as we're seeing the battle for second position. Uh, he's very close, of course. They've been teammates, uh, him and Arthur Camera for ages. Arthur Camera, of course, his trusty partner in crime, being his teammate today, uh, had some uh, wheel issues, if I remember correctly, uh, in, a, in a very recent race. It was pedal issues rather for Nyok. So let's see this battle for second position, though, as Tanitz is to the inside. A nice, clean, easy move at the end. And it does well to get the car slowed down. Doesn't overshoot the chicane. Takes second position. But Martin Kronka on the attack again through the curve of Grande. A little bit of contact between the two cars as Kronka tries to get the overlap before we reach the breaking zone for the second chicane. David Tanitza in the Ferrari on the outside. Martin Kronka on the inside in the VRS Coanda Porsche. Ooh. Can the last of the late breakers win through contact to get in the middle of the corner? Staying too wide. Kronka goes out onto the gravel that slows down the Porsche and David Tanitza a little bit of rubbing is racing and the end result is David Tanitza in the Ferrari retakes or takes for the first time that second position and now he's got to search down the back of the sofa check the pockets of all his jeans that are in the wash to see if he can find 3.2 seconds to close up on Josh Rogers at the lead of the race I think race control might take a look at that. There was obviously contact between the two of them at the first part of the uh, De La Rocha chicane, but then in the second part as well, which sent off Martin Kronker. So uh, I'm sure they'll be taking a quick look. And then a mistake straight afterwards from Kronker did not help matters. Battle further down the order, Egger under an awful lot of pressure from the Ferrari of Van der Velde in that 97 Side Max Motor Work squad. The Lamborghini was very fast up towards Ascari in the early stage of the race that we did catch, but I don't think it's going to be passed by the Ferrari here. Lamborghini still plenty pokey enough. Uh, to get down into Ascari before being passed. So uh, all is fair in that. The thing is, is for, for Tanitza to close down that gap, who does that battle help more than anyone else? It is absolutely Josh Rogers leading the way. And yeah, it's such a, it's now a mountain to climb as DB1 Triton are also a part of this battle. Yeah, very good fight. He's down in 17th position. The leader just say Josh Rogers, a little bit of clean air at this moment in time with the Porsche, but we've still got the strategy of pit stops. We've still got to swap drivers and put the second driver, I say second driver in number, not in skill, of course, into the cars as well. So there's plenty of racing at the front of the field, but Van der Velde currently in 17th position under pressure once again from Dominic Blyer behind. Dominic Blyer trying to find the inside line, nothing doing 
on this occasion. So Van der Velde lives to fight another day in the number 97 Sideworks Motorsports Ferrari 488 GT3. Can he find a way past Matthias Eger ahead of him? Can he defend his position as well as Capuccia? Eighth place in the McLaren under significant pressure now from Nils Nauyorks. Yeah, look at him go, going on the attack straight away into the Lesmo one. Ooh. There's contact between the two. There's a spin firing through the middle of it. It's the Haupt squad, Lucas Muller uh, behind the wheel at the moment. Ew, that is not going to go down well with Niels Nyox going for that spin. It's going to go down great for the uh, Haupt Racing Team Schindler squad. I did see that Danny Juicer was in chat, of course, team manager and part of that squad. Uh, uh, not driving today, though, but uh, yeah. Don't know how you view that. I kind of get the feeling that Niels Nyox, who's instantly on the attack, by the way, getting back past Saclari, I get the feeling he might have touched the curb a little bit too much at Lesmo 1 and drifted out. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Made contact with the curb on the inside of Lesmo 1. That unsettled the car, bounced it off into the side of his rival. And I'll tell you what, at the time we was on board with Capaccia and you saw the amount of speed and reaction on the steering wheel seesawing left and right to try and keep the car in a straight line so great reactions from Capaccia to keep the car facing the right direction and the upshot is he retains that eighth position he's got a little bit of clear air from the drivers behind him as well but just goes to show you at home how hard these drivers work especially when there's been contact and no doubt Nils Nauyox will be uh, cautious for the next few laps as the stewards review that incident rather messy driving I'm afraid from the Dutchman yeah, there was either way contact there and like you say, race control will have their view on it as we're seeing the uh, battle between a team that has recently been announced being run behind the scenes uh, a little bit by the Zancho Sim Sports squad, Ross McGregor and Robbie Stapleford uh, for Jota in this. So it's a, a sort of a semi teammate to the Rocket Sim Sports car that's a bit further up the order. Uh, Ross McGregor being in the wars a little bit in the early stages. Tarek Gamel dropped back towards this uh, battle. So I'm assuming he's had some issues uh, even further through the race because he was up in 25th position back now with Tausch. I'm sure there might be a bit of damage on that ass. And they can fix in the pit stop. It's not too much of a penalty to repair some damage in that pit stop sequence, but certainly not something that you want to do in, I know it's a three hour race, an endurance race in that sense, but three hours in endurance terms is really not very long. No, it's not at all. And of course, we will keep an eye on the pit stop times as and when they start flooding in a little bit later in the race. So anything dramatic happens, no doubt we'll keep on top of that one and let you know. But just going back to Jock Ross McGregor for a moment, very, very fast and established sim race. So not really seen him too prominent in high profile esport events like this. So great to see Ross McGregor in this championship. 27th at the moment, maybe a little bit lower than he would have anticipated being in any normal circumstances but this is all great learning great experience for this as you say very new team to sim race in this very very talented driver 27th position once again that's a very popular piece of beach but Gross McG ross mcgregor manages to keep it pointing in the right direction and that gives terry gamble ahead a little bit of breathing space now in the williams esport aston yeah, potentially gives Novakovsky behind and Crane are a part of this. But yeah, th there's a, a lot of these teams and drivers that have plenty of experience themselves and they bring that to these new brands like the Zantra Simport and Ross McGregor uh, bringing it to the, the Jota name. Uh, behind, you've got Crane, his teammates, Nicholas Hillebrand, who's been in sim race since he's God knows when. Uh, Ross McGregor's been battling for championships since, well, even, I think, 2015, as we're looking at the battle for 16th position, DV1 Triton uh, against the Sidemax Motorworks. And we're looking as well ahead and was a, a distant way down the order as DB1 Triton's going to get to the inside of the uh, of Schoeniger in that sort of GTWR R8G car. Um, GTWR and R8G did have a little bit of a partnership as Schoeniger completely skips uh, the Della Roger chicane that was announced fairly recently though when Schoeniger's uh, driving in those famous R8G colours as the DB1 Triton car comes across. Oh that was naughty. Yeah, that was very naughty indeed. I was about to say Schoeniger had done a good job at the chicane to try and keep himself out of trouble with the late dive down the inside by Dominic Blyer. But unfortunately, before that sentence was uttered, both cars magnetically attracted themselves to each other. And that was not the kind of racing that we like to see. So I do expect Dominic Blyer will be receiving the wrath of our race stewarding team in the very near future because that was naughty is an understatement, I think, on that manoeuvre.
Yeah, definitely would like to take another look at that one because that seemed just a little bit, a little bit dodgy. And what is already quite a bad car at the moment uh, for for Schoeniger in that number 34 uh, Porsche just goes from bad to worse as that is really not going to be enjoyable to to drive. Very much struggling with the damage on that car uh, and also getting the word that way out of the pit window because we've got a uh, remember it's 65 minute stint times is the is the maximum limit, which means that realistically. It, some point you're aiming for hour long stints. Schoeniger has come into the pit lane, had to pit courtesy of that damage. Oh, that's a very, very difficult situation to recover from. Now, Lewis, question for you. We're only uh, just over 30 minutes into the three hour race, as you rightly say, 65 minute maximum stint time and a maximum driving time of 130 minutes. Does Schoeniger get out of the car while repairing this damage and put his teammate in, or does he continue as planned? What would you do as a driver? I, I mean, I don't know what what all, all it is that basically they've they've got in their position is they are going to have to pit one extra time. Normally, every car on the grid we're expected to pit twice, but there's no way that they can uh, make it work. Um, they they need to extend and, and need to go. By the way, sorry, I'm just uh, getting in my ear uh, that Tanitza has to give second position back to Kronka Race Control, getting involved with that, and they're going to switch those two for an unfair overtake that was down, uh, uh, if from memory, serves at Della Roja. They are going to have to switch again. It goes back to a BRS Commander 1-2. Wow, I, I am not sure if I agree with that decision, but race control was spoken, so David Tanitza will do well to cede that position. And sadly for Tanitza, he's actually made a 1.4 second gap to third place Kronka. So that's going to be a very painful decision for the Ferrari drivers. Kevin Ciclari now that we're looking at coming through the final curve of the curve. Parabolica, 13th position, just getting clear of another car. He chases down, still chases down Luca Burke. The big change is Nils Naujoks, of course, is the next car up the road following his contact earlier in the race. But Kevin Ciclari having a good drive in the racing line motorsport aston uh, sorry bentley continental gt3 similarly luca burke as well just outside the points at this moment in time but with all to play for with 226 on the clock yeah just going to say doing an absolutely stunning job in this bentley we, we say the aston martins don't go very well around here neither does the bentley particularly it's a little bit better than the aston martin uh but but not ideal uh, at the moment for the the, the Bentley. But yeah, Saclari's doing an absolutely stunning job at the moment. Maybe just overdoing uh, Della Roja a little bit. He's been repassed by Luca Burke, who's uh, on a bit of a march. Uh, now the 23 getting back past. Also that Honda that was in the background, that is Cameron Bridport uh, and Maloney, who's currently in the 286 uh, Team BUSR car. So uh, there's the, the the switch between them. That's how Schoenega went off then, uh, courtesy of DV1 Triton, so that was down at the Della Roja chicane. That's not the incident between Kronka and Tanitza, uh, but that is where one of the GTWR cars went for a spin, being Chiriello. Yes, that's one that we missed at the drama just a few yards further up the road, but Corrado Chirello and uh, Marco Miore sharing that car in the AMG Mercedes, going wrong in a big, big way now. The damage probably won't be significant enough to require any particular work on the pit stop. But the downside is he's lost a lot of track position, lost a lot of time, lost a lot of position. So it's going to take a big recovery as we're looking now at David Tanitza, newly reinstalled into third position. He's got his tail up now. He fancies that one back again from Kronka ahead. So David Tanitza. He's a calm fellow, but he will be moderately incensed, I think, by that decision and will be doing all that he can to try and recover that place. See, this is the thing, this is what I don't get about that whole scenario as we're going to re-watch again. This is uh, the battle. So you see that spin-off in the background. This is where the DV1 Triton car of Blyer comes back onto the race circuit. Oh, see, it's not as bad as I thought. I mean, like, it's bad, don't get me wrong. It's not as bad as I thought in the sense of, like, where um, Dominic Blyer was. He was kind of at a point where he was just trying to rejoin the racetrack, because otherwise two wheels are going to go on the grass. And it just so happened that the that um, Schoeniger was sort of overlapping in the wrong sort of way. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure Race Control will take a look at that ad nauseum. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how they view that one. Back to the, the point I was going to make on Tanitza, is that if you've made contact like that, which 
uh, you know, it was it was a little bit dodgy between the two, but that final hit that sent Kronker off into the gravel trap. If you're in the early stages, you're the first half an hour, first hour of the race, and you know there's live race control, just give the position back. Because the problem is, is like you say, he went 1.4 seconds down the road. Now he's had to give all of that advantage back and has to attack the Porsche again, and he has less time to do it. Just switch the positions by yourself and get on the attack straight away. Yep, and one wonders if the VRS Coanda team have been nice and clever, suspected that a give back order would be issued by race control, and just ask Kronker to drop back a little bit, just to give right. free advantage and lap time to their sister car at the front of the field. If so, that would be a good strategic move from that team, because uh, Samira Brahmi at the moment doing a good job in fourth place, but doesn't quite have the lap time, it seems, to stay with these top three drivers. So it very much is a, uh, a one-horse race at the very front, and two and three glued together. Yeah, but it can very, very quickly switch around as clearly Kronker defending quite hard from Tanitza. Kronker uh, did race yesterday, uh, ended up eighth position on the road to a fair way behind um, Josh Rogers, who ended up second, and a fair way behind the man who's directly behind him, who ended up winning the race as well for good measure. So plenty of talent behind. Two hours, 20 minutes to go. If, if you're that Ferrari, though, if you're Tanitza and you know you've got that kind of pace, he did win the race yesterday by four seconds, bearing in mind it was an hour-long race. Considering the gap, two hours left, 6.6 .6 seconds, you'd kind of feel that if you can kind of do the same thing again, you can close that gap back down again. Yeah, we saw that a lot. Tire wear, it's a hot day at Monza today in the virtual world. Tire wear is a thing for sure in this sim, and it will come into play in this race as well. Of course, the drivers will change the boots at, the, at their pit stops when they uh, make their strategic pit stops. But if you look after your tyres, your car is going to be in a better, more attacking spirit towards the end of your stint, as I think we may be seeing now with David Tanitza really, really balancing the car on the edge of the Ascara chicane on his tiptoes in the Ferrari at the moment. Not quite close enough to get a run down in the parabolic. I don't think he's going to show his nose anyway, just to let the car ahead know that he's there and that he's interested in the overtake. But again, going back to my point there, Lewis, is the drivers who can look after their car to keep their car alive towards the end of the stint, that's when overtaking is theoretically going to be a little bit easier for them than at the earlier stages when everything's a little bit more balanced out. 100% it's all about playing the long game. Those that are yeah. used to sprint racing uh, will not necessarily know the, the the playing the long game and waiting for things to happen. It looked a bit close there between Tunitza and Kronker as they run down into uh, the first came once again. Our focus a little bit further down as there we go. Tunitza has actually made the move. He's got it done. I think it was around the outside uh, at the, the Retifilio and Tunitza up into second position but look at this Kronka is not waiting at all as they're going to go side by side it was a defensive line from the 51 to try and cover off before we even get to this section at the Della Roger chicane he's at the inside this is where the two came together a few laps ago and had to switch back round but this time it is all good for the Ferrari and the 51 heads up into second Fantastic still from David Tanitza and even more fantastic is the slinky camera work by our broadcast team of Mike and Steve. Fabulous stuff there, seeing the camera just moving around, following the action live as it happens as David Tanitza moves himself back up into that second place. A very brave drive actually, but credit where credit's due from both drivers. Gave each other enough racing room. Martin Kronka realised when it got to the point of no return, there's no point fighting it anymore, allowed the position to be conceded. So good driving from both there and a great bit of camera work as well. Lovely bit of camera. I always love seeing uh, seeing the camera work that we get in sim racing these days. It's not as simple as just uh, point and shoot and hope for the best. These days, uh, it's it's so much much more of a bigger and more professional uh, uh, thing behind the scenes to bring you live coverage of each round. And uh, we're all the better for it because it gives us better things to watch. It makes the drivers want to push that a little bit harder because they want to be on a cool looking broadcast like what we have here. So fantastic work uh, as we're going to see a battle for fifth position. Uh, Noble, he's been in the wars a little bit in the Lamborghini, the highest place Lamborghini, but he's now got the Ferrari of Santoro directly behind John Lacey Esports Academy. Don't think he's going to be close enough, but essentially going to look for a dive, drops back in line and holds on to six. Yeah, Santoro there just trying to fill the mirrors of Mike Noble ahead, make Mike Noble defend fresh air and compromise himself 
on corner exit but Noble wasn't bored yesterday he's been around a fair while knows exactly when he is in danger of being overtaken and when he is not so continued on his racing line but Santoro has got to try these little tactics the easiest overtake one can ever make is when you force the driver ahead into a mistake rather than forcing your car into a gap so it's far far more preferable if you can go past a delayed car that have to go too wide in the braking zone but I, I fear Mike Noble is going to require quite a considerable more effort from Santoro to find the way past the Englishman yeah absolutely uh, 100 percent the easiest uh, car to overtake is one you don't have to overtake at all i'm pretty sure by the way that kronker and tunitza uh with the other alvarez replay there we go oh, there's the panic uh i did wonder what happened right let's take a look at what happened it must be a dive at least for, from from where i was sitting and where we jumped back onto it must be a dive around the outside from the ferrari of tunitza he's actually gonna no correction it is to the inside and he's gonna absolutely send it in there and gets by on the VS. That is a lovely move. Absolutely spot on. Yeah, that is a measured overtaking manoeuvre. Inch perfect braking, inch perfect car placement as well. Kronka sees it coming, allows it to go ahead and tries to get the run off of the corner through the curve of Grande down into the chicane. Kronka side by side, but he's on the suboptimal outside line. There's still a chance if he can hold the car along the outside, it will become the inside for the next part of the corner. But at this stage in the race, at least, David Tenitz are very good on the brakes, can retain the position and is second place now the big noise about that is he's seven get that again seven seconds away from rogers in race lead so david tenitzer has got to find a lot of lap time remember it was 3.6 lewis when he originally overtook the uh Kronka number 88 Porsche so it's seven seconds now he's in arrears that's a big amount of time to find even if it's two hours and 17 minutes in which to find it yeah, but again, he did win the race yesterday by four seconds, so you never know, and depending on yeah. when you switch drivers, it could be very important. Let's watch these two battling out. BS Competition versus Rocket Simsport. Attila Dench just going to try and hang on against the Rocket Simsport McLaren. It is an absolute send-in there by the Slovenian, and there is contact between the Slovenian and the Hungarian. And also, look at that coming through the middle. Hello, Sakari. There's the position gained, and there will be talks be between, uh, I think, Rocket Simsport and BS Competition uh, race control will be taking a, uh, a a bit of a look at that whether Attila Dench missed the De La Roche chicane to hold the position or uh, you know whether it was contact that sent him off there or what there's there's plenty of sort of scenarios they do but that is why we have live race control Ah, yes, and better them than me because uh, I would hate to be in the position of making judgment calls on these many, many different incidents that we've had throughout the course of the first 50 minutes just under of racing here at the first round of the GT World Challenge Esports Europe Endurance Series. This is the first round of the Endurance Championship. We've got a six hours coming up in June and a 24 hours at Spa as well later in the year. So plenty of racing still to go as we're looking now. Another great piece of camera work Ooh. here. The battle for position. The Lamborghini ahead, keeping the outside line into the chicane. That opens the door. Thank you very much indeed. And Mike Noble finds himself one place further down the running order in sixth. What a, what a shot there. Love that. Love seeing the uh, the, uh, the double on board side by side, one of one way and one of the other. Fantastic stuff. And uh, a decent move up inside the top five for the Jean Lacy Esports Academy squad. Does seem as if the Lamborghini uh, that's currently being driven uh, by Noble is just dropping off a little bit on pace here as well. So he's got to be careful of the uh, Unicorns of Love car. As no, saying that, the Jean Lacy Esports Academy car of Santoro runs a little bit wide. He's going to have to defend into Lesmo 1, and that Merc is going to be catching bit by bit. Gronewald directly behind the wheel. He's been allowed to clear off from the entire back behind as Capoccia and Muller uh, are, are, are battling it out quite hard uh, as far as I'm aware for eighth position. So there is a large gap uh, forming here. And meanwhile, while these two continue to race hard, the number 34 Predator Sim Racing by R8G Porsche of Schoeniger and Chris Hartfeld is in pit road. So there's some kind of issues before the number 34 car and he's retired from the race so we're just hearing now sad news there that the Schoeniger and Hartfeld Porsche of Predator Sim Racing by R8G has retired from the race. 
Yeah, that was, uh, of course, Schoeniger, who drives for w, the, the WPS racing team, the young German, um, uh, joining that outfit for this season as well. Uh, GTWR uh, back squad, so they're a, a very, very strong outfit, at least on a Seto Corsa Competizione. So it's a shame for them to be out so early. Still have uh, a, a car, and then uh, if you really count them as GTWR, they've got a few cars still left on the grid. Uh, one of those cars being directly behind this battle, Simonini, in that 157 Audi now doing the uh, full honours for the R8G name as we're seeing that battle for 11th position. Saclari going to try and get a move on Attila Dench who missed De La Roger just a lap ago. Is the Bentley going to be able to make the stick? I don't think he is and the McLaren is sitting waiting for something to happen. Yeah, Luca Burke very much the man on the move at the back of that shot in the McLaren. Just seeing what these two cars unfold between them, seeing if they can hold each other up or even potentially make a little bit of contact. And then Luca Burke will be in a position to pounce. We're riding on board now with Burke, 13th place in the Rocket Sim Sport McLaren 720S, heading down into the second chicane. Catch a little bit of curve on the inside, try and get a good run before we get down into the first of the two Lesbos. You can see the back of the Bentley. The Bentley's a big old car. So is the BMW GT3 ahead of it. Luca Burke in a much more modern design and shape. It seems like he's got the pace at this stage in the race, but as has been the case throughout the course of this weekend in ACC SRO competition at Monza, overtaking is difficult here with the level of the drivers and Luca Burke just keeping calm letting these two fight it out till it ends your head in the BMW goes defensive that'll compromise him through the Ascari chicane they'll get a suboptimal run onto the following straight this opens the door now for the Bentley ahead to try and attack Luca Burke closer than he's ever been a double slipstream coming into the curve of Barabolica early decision to go to the outside anticipate the Bentley going to the inside of the BMW will try and switch it back now will Luca Burke to get a good run off of the final corner down the start finish straight is elected to get the slipstream of the BMW they go too wide and this now coming into T1 is Luca Burke's big chance to clear both cars yeah of course he'll be a little bit frustrated on that move that happened between himself and Attila Dench uh, a couple of laps ago a bit of an apology in chat by BS competition as well to the Rocket Sim Sport squad that BMW though does seem plenty fast enough in a straight line to keep the 191 Bentley at bay um, for now there is no position change but I don't know about you I think that run looks a little bit better from the Bentley now the question is if there is side by side uh, action coming into the De La Roche chicane if uh, Attila Dench is on the outside is he going to do the same thing he did on Luca Burke and skip the chicane to hold the position which we've uh, seen a little bit no need to answer that question but still I, I, I wonder if race control might be on it yeah they'll be keeping their eye on everything we're getting a warning that's Dills now York so that's the incident that we saw yeah. earlier on a bit of warning for aggressive driving so now York's considering himself a little bit lucky I think on that one as we're seeing two three cars trying to occupy the space of where one would normally exist and that's Capaccia in the McLaren 10th position at this moment in time 9th position I think that is is now York oh Nils now York oh. makes contact with the AMG Mercedes Capaccia gets involved as well that's Muller going sideways stationary in the middle of the road Nils now York's not moments after being warned for aggressive driving rear ends the back of one of his rivals moves further up into the points but sadly for the AMG Mercedes of Lucas Muller heavy heavy damage and plummeting down the run in order Lewis what do you make of that one yeah I don't know if they were trying to bump draft if Niels Nyox was just trying to push the Mercedes we don't really know if at least from that angle if the Mercedes moved a little bit uh, uh, but either way for Muller absolutely sent into the barrier Niels Nyox will be having a very big question from race control as to what happened like you said seconds after receiving a warning for aggressive driving from race control then has that incident befall him oh i don't know again we've only seen it from one angle so i'm not going to try and throw anyone under the bus in that scenario but it did look like it was almost a failed attempt of a bump draft which i don't think will go down well with race control 
Yeah, real, real difficult times for Muller in the number four Mercedes. He's down pit road now, no doubt getting that damage repaired. It's still worth staying in this race. Two hours and ten minutes to go. Anything could happen, even if you are significantly held up as Kevin Siclari now, side by side, into the Della Rogge chicane on the Bentley. Goes there, that's not Siclari, sorry. That is Luca Burke, I think it is, trying to make his way up the running order as well. So Luca Burke now encouraged about the incident further ahead. That moves him into 11th place. The next one is point position held by Attila Denk. So everybody moves up one. And there's a question mark over uh, Nils Naujok's currently in eighth position as well. So maybe something will come his way in another place can be gained. Remember, folks at home, top 10 score points. This is point scoring championship and they're fighting for a part of the 15,000 euro minimum prize draw pot in this championship. So get in the top five, get a share of that money. Yeah, tight stuff from them. Let's take a look then at the replay. So there's the Yaz Heat car that skipped over. That was Capoccia uh, ahead of all of this. There's Niels Nyox, who makes almost a little bit of contact with the back of the 720. So you've got the Haupt Racing Squad around the outside trying to make a move on the Yaz Heat car. The BMW Team G2 Esports car that's just to the inside. Good move there around the outside from, or maybe a little bit too wide, from Muller. But then this is the big moment. What happened here so we've got the mercedes ahead holding in the middle of the road then ah right so as soon as niels nyox went for a little bit of a move left they just kind of moved at the same time nyox decided to then try and move back over as it was being covered just a messy messy incident i think that might have been the rhg uh audi as well that took a bit of a hit but yeah very very messy yeah, the Mercedes got secondary contact as well for good measure. So disastrous for Muller. Still down pit road actually at this moment in time. Getting the car repaired. Simonini, 18th position at the moment in the 157. Audi is on pit road as well. So that's getting in and around where we would start to think about expecting early first stops to take place as uh, one of the Williams Esports. Astons makes oh, contact no. with the Honda. It is mental hour here in the SRO Esports endurance season contact everywhere you see and that is one of the Aston Martins getting heavily involved in his rivals we go to another replay so this is now Yox on board once again we see the Mercedes ahead of us we're going down the back straight both cars in a straight line now Yox gets a bit of a run a bit of a wobble from the Merc ahead as well and oh, Lewis toss a coin what, what, what do you what do you say who's who's at fault what happened there I'd almost, if if I was, you know, if I was in racing, I know they want to deal with things straight away, but I'd almost want to sit down with both the drivers and actually understand what happened there from both points of view. Because, uh, and then obviously, you know, this is a, this is actually one of the beautiful things about sim racing is we've got so much data and telemetry to go over that you can really look at what happened in that scenario and whether the Merc was also moving uh, and, and, you know, how that all unfolded with Niels Nyox. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I, I kind of feel that... You know, if you're going to put blame on anyone in that scenario, it's probably more so the, the way of Niels Nyox, but that is, that is a decision for race control. I really don't know uh, how to view that one because that is a tough sequence. As you say, though, uh, when we are in that pit window sequence, when we were speaking about the gap that was uh, 7.4 seconds, was it, between the race leaders, it's now 6.5. So Tanitza has closed it down somewhat over the last 15 minutes, yes, by only a second, but consistency in closing that gap down bit by bit to a driver who is also fairly inexperienced on the platform being Josh Rogers. I know he was, did very well yesterday, but those bits, that pressure, that that's where things can happen. So maybe not an instant move right now, but something that may be cooking up before the end of the race. Yeah, plenty of drama, plenty of drama continues in the GT World Challenge Esports Europe Endurance Season. If you're just joining us, hello and welcome to the broadcast where almost one hour in to our first three-hour endurance race of the season. We've had fights, we've had contact, we've had great racing and we're only just getting in to the first pit stop window. Josh Rogers for VRS Coanda leads the race from second position on the grid. His teammate Martin Kronka has dropped down into third place from pole position and Ferrari Driver Academy champion of the 2019 Formula 1 Esports World Championship and race winner yesterday in the sprint series, David Tanitza, is currently in second place and fighting for that race victory. Further down the running order, Lewis and I have been treated to a festival of action for pretty much every place on the grid. There's 34 cars 
in this race and each and every single one of them are hungry to move further forward as we're looking at the Bentley Continental GT3 of Kevin Ciclare who has been pretty much glued either in front of or behind Luca Burke in the McLaren so far in this first hour as Neil Lewis. I was going to say, how many times have we seen, like, we've, we've cut to this battle, and, oh, no, the other way around, oh, no, no, that way around, oh, no, that way around. It's only been 55 minutes in the race. We've seen them uh, battling with other people. You know, obviously, they were having that battle with BS Competition a little bit earlier with Attila Dench. Uh, they've switched around. They've been back the other way. They've had people attacking them from behind, and somehow these two are still glued together uh, uh whether that will continue over the rest of the race because we are approaching as you said we're approaching that position where we're going to get the first pits off they will be within the next 10 minutes because they must pit uh before the hour and 55 to go so after 65 minutes of the race action now whether they do a driver swap or not is is up up to them it's up you know however they decide to do it the maximum driver time is an hour and 30 oh sorry is a uh, 130 minutes so two hours and 10 minutes uh, of the running of the race so uh, obviously if you do the 265 minutes then that's your, your, your lot but yeah if you're josh rogers do you stay in the car if i'm tanitza i'm staying in the car i get the feeling that they need to keep it that way round yeah exactly there's a very uh, interesting strategic story arc running through this race exactly around that one about what driver at which time do you have in the car do you use the the fact that the driver is well embedded into the car they're well experienced they know what the track conditions are like they know what the car feels like or do you get fresh pair of hands behind the wheel that's not having undertaken the first hour of the race so they're fresh they're charged up they're ready to go that's going to be fascinating to see which team pulls which strategic decision as we've seen the Bentley taking the wide line the McLaren ahead taking the tight line but that's worked very nicely indeed thank you very much for Kevin Ciclare in the Bentley Continental as he gets a run down into T1 we run back now to Ross McGregor making nice progress 27th second at this moment in time is McGregor in the 720s McLaren so he's moved up a few places from a slightly slower start to this race weekend so McGregor still thinking there's an opportunity for a top 10 if the cards fall in his direction over the course of the next two and a bit hours they do need a fair amount of luck I mean that car behind that Audi the 1210 Docks Motorsports car I mean that car has had a penalty this race it was one of the uh, uh, the most recent drive through penalties uh, that, that we've had uh, that was for contact with one of the GTWR cars that was actually the one that we saw uh, into um, Lesmo 1 with Chiriello behind the wheel uh, so that was this car that was at fault uh, and deemed so as they're going to be a potential dive into turn one but Ross McGregor is going to fend that one off uh, Tarek Gamel into the pit lane directly behind I think he might pass the uh, hands of the, the the car over to the likes of Jack Keithley just want to say very very quickly before we get into inevitably more action uh, I'm curious how Josh Rogers is going to do in the, the race leading car because he's teamed up uh, at the moment with Pash Gerges who is a driver who's been a part of that team for a while they've been teamed up a fair few times but normally Josh Rogers is partner in crime is normally Mitchell de Jong and they both uh, uh, stay in the the Coanda sim house in Germany I wonder how, with Pash Gerges being a part of this, uh, what the, the experience is in, in ACC, and maybe even spicing up the driver like with it being them two in the car, I wonder how that one's going to, to play out. Yeah, that's going to be a very interesting story to keep an eye on over the course of the next couple of hours of racers. Once again, Ciclare and uh, Luca Burke are as one. We see one of the Aston Martins in the background running down pit road as well so as you say the pit strategies are starting but Ciclari now closer than he's ever been before heading into the red affiliate has got the inside on Luca Burke does he have enough braking capacity no he does not Luca Burke retains position once again Kevin Ciclari slots back in behind once again and tries to think of another strategy to find his way past the McLaren he'll be sick absolutely sick and tired of the rear spoiler of that 720s by the time this race comes to an end yeah, maybe a switcher driver or something just yeah. to get away from that McLaren might actually assist things in this scenario. Glad we're not seeing any bump draft in between the two because uh, that has ended in tears for a few drivers. Uh, Tausch are also in the pit lane with Van der Velde, as you said. So that's the two side Max Motorworks cars, both in pit lane to try and undercut some of it. We are an hour into the race, so we are very much approaching that position uh, of that pit stop sequence as we see the Odox Motorsport car getting by Jota. And I believe it is the GTWR uh, car directly behind that uh, Aston Martin that's going to be closing in. Uh, there, 
there was damage on Ross McGregor in the early stage of the race, so it does have some straight line speed deficiency uh, on the car. So clearly struggling, was, was involved. I think it was in the first lap carnage through here. Um, maybe the carbon sim sport car um, was was involved in so clearly not been it's, it's been deep in the walls David Tonitza into the pit lane so Tonitza and fourth place Samir Abrami as well jump down pit road so these are our first of the race leading cars deciding to make their pit strategy almost exactly on the one hour mark so this suggests potentially they're going to go for a double stint with one driver and put the next driver in for the final portion of the race we will find out David Tonitza comes down pit road third position on the racetrack at that moment in time it will be critical for David Tonitza to get back out onto the racetrack again in clean air he will have new tires they'll be cold at the beginning the brakes will be cold the pressures will be low he'll need to bring the car back up into the optimum operating temperature and window of performance but he'll need to do that without having to worry about other drivers around him as well Samira Brahmi about four or five seconds in arrears behind him as well so let's see how Samir Abrami comes out in this pit window cycle but several cars starting to make the jump now and Josh Rogers still in the front of the field has the advantage that he can see what everybody else does and make their decision based on their rivals manoeuvres. I don't think VRS Commander Tim Sport will be particularly worried at the moment, but then how they play their strategy here when it comes to the tyres. And like you say, making sure... I mean, this is one thing that, that uh, is really, really noted in, in ATC more so than I've actually noticed in some other simulators. I'm not going to name names, don't worry, uh, any fans out there. Um, is that you're getting your tyre pressures right and getting them up to temperature not too quickly, not too slowly, but at the right rate is really, really hard. Getting the word that Josh Rogers has been in to the pit lane as we're seeing this is the early part of the race so this is where ross mcgregor was uh on the opening lap of the race with one of the hondas uh around so this is where there's going to be contact uh and ross mcgregor is going to get damaged there's the spin and then off uh and i think this is going to continue on the exit of the corner i think the 720 might also come through and all this no it's all right but a fair amount of damage there and this is kind of the, the, the important note that we want to get from this is that a lot of cars are going to have a fair amount of damage out there particularly in that mid pack and down the back end of the field yeah exactly whether you decide to repair that damage or live with it depending on the time loss on pit road is very much an individual's decision and a team decision based on where they are on the racetrack ross mcgregor doing his best pinball wizard there bouncing off as many cars as possible in a shorter space of time as possible but now as the pit windows are starting to cycle the way through nils now is our current race leader on track of course hasn't been down pit road at this moment in time uh, we're looking at the uh, honda of the number 94 on the coming down pit road so nicholas hildebrand is the second driver in there ben craner is currently in the driver's seat started the car qualified the car as well and i'm curious to see where is david tenitza on the racetrack has he come out in front of samir Ibrahim? does he have the clean air around him because of course brand new tires on that car can he perform an undercut on josh rogers probably not for track position but certainly could give him a bit of an advantage to close down some of that gap we'll close back on that in just a second as there we go we've got de salvo Ooh. behind the wheel so there has been a driver switch within the team as the battle uh, a bit further up this is for 12th position yaz heat versus bs competition and a potential switch uh, incoming but interesting to see as uh, oh never mind here goes the yaz heat around the outside uh, and BS competition are going to be dropped down a fresh one from the 720 Eamon Murphy fresh behind the wheel uh, taking over from Capoccia but yet yeah, very interesting to see the salvo behind the wheel I don't know if I'd have made that call Oh, I'm very surprised by that, but I must admit, I thought they'd have kept it. So doing oh. a very good job as Murphy gets a little bit of contact on the rear quarter panel from the BS competition. BMW side by side now running down in the chicane. Murphy does not like that one bit, gives him a little bit of rub saying, thanks for your contact, have it back. I don't want it. This is mine. 11th place secured. And now a Lamborghini and a Ferrari decide, hello, this looks like an interesting party. I brought beer. Can I come with you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I, I, I worry if Murphy maybe turned it a little bit too sharp uh, running through uh, that the, the De La Roger chicane and maybe pinched off 
um, Attila Dench, and that might be why we sent off. But the, the contact and the run into Lesme One's pretty unacceptable. I'm sure race control might take a, a dim view on it. Not again, not apparently, even more so uh, in the potential region of a warning. Egger still behind the wheel with Van der Velde, who's going to try and make a move on a Lamborghini into the Parabolica. Got no slipstream though, so he's going to have to drop in behind the Lamborghini, who does so from the M6 BS competition car as uh, everyone else into the pit lane. Josh Rogers still behind the wheel, the Salvo behind. Did hear that it was potentially a slow stop from Kronker and a fast one uh, from Tanitza and De Salvo. So uh, switching, and you can see it was a fast stop from De Salvo because I believe it was only a couple of seconds between him and Rogers. Oh, fantastic stuff. The race is coming alive at the front of the field, just as we suggested it would do, thanks to the pit cycles, thanks to the strategies. New drivers behind the wheel, new exciting talents to keep our eye on and can. Giovanni Di Salvo, first time in the car today, finished just off the podium yesterday in the sprint series. Can Di Salvo do the can build on the good work, should I say, put my teeth in, build on the good work of David Tinitza and start to take it to the race leading VRS Coanda Porsche. We'll find out two and a half seconds is but nothing with an hour and 50 more four minutes left to go Matthias Egger now that we're looking at in the Lamborghini we see him in the picture in picture as well trying to find a way past the Tilly Dench in the number 89 BMW ahead van der Velde in the Ferrari that's been hanging onto the coattails of pretty much every fight in this 11th 12th 13th 14th region of the race is still there and a Rodnikov is just a little further back in the Aston Martin, number 41 in 15th place. So these cars have got to sort of filter themselves back out again. But one of the big winners, one of the big winners here, Luca Burke, 10th position. Yeah, gaining a couple in the 720. Uh, he did lose the position to Shint in the pit lane, though, so that Bentley did get ahead, although we've seen those two switch around. Now on the back of Arthur Camera as we're riding on board with Egger, who you saw the intensity. Of course, uh, one of the beautiful things that we've got here is face cams of all of them. We can see, we can see into uh, any driver and see the real intensity that they're fighting with, and it also means that if there's contact between them, uh, we can get live reactions, which sometimes is good and other times <laughs> less so. Uh, but either way, I will say, if now I, I did say before that pit stop sequence, if I'm VRS commander, I'm not really worried. I am worried now, considering how much time they gained on the pit stop sequence. Remember that Dane Warren was quite slow in the Asia Esports Sprint Championship uh, a bit earlier uh, in the week. There we have, by the way, appearing on your leaderboard on the left-hand side, Arthur Camera, the 62, uh, that is the BMW Team G2 Esports car, receiving a drive-through penalty for the Haupt Racing car contact that we did catch, uh, that a few teams and few drivers were uh, afforded some lovely damage from. Uh, so they've adjudicated it and viewed it being the fault of Niels Nyox, and the penalty goes the way of G2. And a drive-through in a race like this of this intensity, Paul, is... It's not good. That is not good. No, that's going to move them well outside of the points. Eighth position at the moment. A drive-through is one thing where they go down pit lane, put on the pit lane speed limit on the line, drive through, don't need to stop, and then come back out of pit road again. So it could be worse. It could be a stop-and-go penalty, which is very much game over. But Arthur Camera will be frustrated having just taken over that G2 Esports BMW. will need to serve that penalty. But again, we've said it a few times. It's worth reiterating. An hour and 51 minutes left on the clock. There's still opportunity to recover that and score some strong points top 10 drivers receive points towards the championship so it's not over until it's over yeah 100 percent at least it's not a uh, drive-through penalty at spa those ones cost you up to, to <laughs> sort of 60 90 seconds and using the endurance pit lane around here uh, it's more the 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 loss of uh, 33 around 33 seconds uh, the expected loss to pit lane so yes it's bad but it could be an awful lot worse gap for the race leaders Arthur Camera comes into the pit lane to serve that drive through penalty uh, down to 2.1 seconds to Salvo is closing in on Josh Rogers it goes back out to 2.5 as the battle for 11th position is going to see the Lamborghini of Egger going to try and go around the outside of BS competitions BMW I'm not so sure that one's going to work although he's absolutely committed to it and Egger's going to try and convince his way up into 11th Seventh position, Attila Dench down one, and look who's going to try and fire his way through. Sidemax Motorworks, Van der Velde directly behind as well. Sensational, sensational overtake from the Lamborghini. Arbatayas Egger moves himself up 
into 11th, 12th position, sorry, Van der Velde now trying to find a way past. As we said before, he's been hanging onto the coattails of many a fight in this race, but not getting too heavily involved himself is Van der Velde in the 97, just watching what's happening and unfolding ahead of him as he creeps ever, ever closer to that all-important top 10 and championship points towards this title fight in the GT World Challenge Esports Europe endurance season. But Matthias Eger, outstanding drive, trust in his rival Attila Denks. Both drivers gave each other racing room and we didn't expect it to pull it off, but he did indeed and the Lamborghini moves on up the order. Next on the list is Eamon Murphy in the McLaren, currently the holder of the final points paying position. Yeah, truly brilliant move. Uh, there is one team that I am actually genuinely surprised when it comes to the Lamborghinis. Uh, it is DV1 Triton Racing, who are, they're, uh, especially in Polish sim racing, uh, a force to be reckoned with uh, on a set of Corsa and a set of Corsa Competizioni. Tauskovic uh, now behind the wheel of that car that really is a little bit down the order. Of course, they uh, have been in the wars a little bit. Did uh, Dominic Blyron uh, have received a penalty uh, from memory? It was. Did they get a penalty for that with the incident between uh, themselves uh, and Schoeninger? Don't remember. Race Control will update me on that. But... Um, they're, they're down the order than where they really feel they should be, especially with that Lambo actually not being too bad around here as the battle for third position, that final spot on the rostrum, is starting to heat up. And did you see that? The Pavlovsky, now behind the wheel of the John Lacey Esports Academy car, is a part of it very much closing in. Yeah, Chris Erke, Kamal Pavlovsky, both drivers starting to bang into that fight for the rostrum at this moment in time. So the racing at the front of the field is incredibly tight. Two and a half seconds, Gianni De Salvo still needs to find over our race leader, Martin Kronka, in third position for his second stint in the car. Currently still in third position after the pit stops. Chris Herker in fourth place, been very quiet so far in this race, not seen much from the very talented German driver, but expect him to come on strong as we're looking on board now with Chris Herker in the number 22 Porsche, just behind him. We can't see it on this screen because we're looking forward, but if we look back, we would see Kamal Pavlovsky in the 27 Ferrari all over the rear of Chris Herker. So very, very soon indeed, the fight for the final step of the podium is going to increase in intensity and just look how concentrated and unruffled Chris Herker looks behind the wheel of his car just intense focus on the back of that Porsche willing his car along to try and dispossess that place from Martin Kronker ahead while setups and stuff may be different obviously between the cars the, the the fact that it's Porsche versus Porsche you understand what you're battling with you know where that car's weak once that Ferrari catches behind uh, if it does indeed catch it is a little way back a little bit further back than I thought it was um, but if that Ferrari does catch behind then you've kind of got that that unknown quantity in the battle as we are seeing uh, 94 and 55 that is a, a 15 second time penalty on the next pit stop for the 50 Five, uh, not sure who the 55 is, uh, the Williams Esports, uh, the Williams Esports car, so that's uh, Tarek Gamil and um, uh, uh, Jack Keithley, so they'll be receiving a 15 second time penalty on the next time they enter the pit stop, which obviously they don't have to instantly come in a serve, it's not a 15 second stop and go, it's just additional to the pit stop or the, the race finish time, which obviously they're not getting that far. Yeah, Bit illegal yeah. if they did. Been a difficult, difficult race for Tariq Gamble and Jack Heathley in the Williams Esport Aston Martin Vantage AMR so far in the course of this race. But as we said before, it's a championship, it's a five round championship, it's 42 hours of racing ahead of us from beginning to end. So every lap, every minute in the car, every scenario that you experience is learnings, is good information to put into the data bank to use to your advantage further down the road. So even days like today, when it nightmarish on paper for the Williams Esport drivers, they'll have taken away so much useful information, especially for a driver like Tarek Gamble, who's very much a new entry into the Williams Esport team. That is vital information, vital data, vital experiences that will make him a stronger driver next time the cars come out on track. And that can't be discounted, can it, Lewis? Even drivers at this level, with this experience, you still learn something new every time you're on the racetrack. Oh, 100%. Yeah, you need to get out there and just learn what's happening, especially if it's a simulator that you're uh, fairly unfamiliar with. I don't know how much Jack Keith has done on a set of course of competition. He's done a fair amount, but uh, more so fancy himself as a, a touring car racer than an endurance uh, superstar, but certainly uh, acclimatizing to a set of course of competition well. And to be fair, if you're going to have a bad uh, round, 
why not have it at a circuit where quite clearly your car's struggling for Williams Esports there in the Aston Martin, which we can quite clearly see is not the favoured vehicle today. Uh, Yiga Rogorognikov being the highest placed one uh, in 14th position in that number 41 Simware Dot Pro car. Uh, did get word that Martin Kronker overdid the Retifilio uh, this lap, so he is very much under pressure from Chris Herker uh, directly behind. Very calm. I, uh, I had a chat with, with Chris Herker uh, about a week ago um, before, uh, before another race. Very calm demeanor, very patient uh, in a mindset, and, and certainly that is matching very, very well to the high intensity out there on the track at the moment. Yeah, it's exactly what you need to do, isn't it? Keep your head when all of those around you are losing theirs, and that is exactly what is happening at this stage of the moment. But Robbie Stapleford, we're looking at now having a overtake achieved on him. So Robbie Stapleford dropping down the order, new, fresh into the car, vacated by Ross McGregor, 23rd position at this moment in time. But a quick update that I've just been giving some information about the top three average lap times in the first in. The number 18 car of Josh Rogers. Average lap time, 1 minute 48.457. Car number 51 of David Vitinitsa, 1 minute 48.578. And Martin Kronke in the number eight, uh, number 88, 1 minute 48.753. So separation of fractions of tenths of a second between the top three. That is absolute intensity. Drivers driving their respective cars to the absolute limit of what they're capable of achieving, isn't it? Yeah, and not only that, we can keep an eye on that and see how it unfolds over this stint as well, as as far as my knowledge is that it is closing again, uh, once again for the race lead, down to two seconds as Luca Burke defending from Eamon Murphy, 720 from 720, so for Rocket Sim Sports, uh, they, they jumped through the pit stop, the Yaz Heat squad, uh, and now having to do battle with them uh, once again. Now, we, we did see that the, the 191 and the 23 were separated by absolutely nothing over the first stint. Now, after the pit stop sequence, there seems to be a gap forming. Shint's behind the wheel, taking over from Saklari. Luca Burke, the Slovenian, remaining behind the wheel of uh, the, the Rocket Sim Sports car. So, uh, I think whilst the pressure builds as well from behind the 149 of the Yazhi Eamon Murphy, once that's you know constantly attacking, constantly applying pressure, that gap's going to get bigger and bigger. And so for the Race 9 Motorsports, well, this is exactly what they wanted. It is indeed as Robbie Stapleford goes further down the running order again. So two laps, two positions lost for Robbie Stapleford in the number 38 McLaren 720S that you're seeing on your screen now. He's trying to get a bit of a run on the car ahead can he find a way past Sidorich ahead of him or will he keep that 24th position let's have a quick look now as we run down into the second chicane Stapleford just started to show his nose realizes it doesn't quite have enough poke in a straight line not enough confidence at this stage in his new stint on the brakes of the car so Sidorich ahead continues to move forward Stapleford continues to slowly drop down the order I mean, he, Robbie Stapleford is quite a young man. I think he's 14, 15 years of age, latest uh, pickup in the team of Zansho Simsport. Uh, so just more so in this, more from an experience standpoint and learning bit by bit and moving his way forward. So again, the squad will just be informing him and keeping him up to date with what's going on. Uh, and they won't be telling him that his teammate is under an awful lot of pressure as uh, Eamon Murphy does get by the Rocket Simsport squad of Luca Burke. So Murphy up a position, moving forward potentially sets his sights on the 191 directly ahead as we return a bit further down the order to see a couple of battles ahead and a couple of battles behind as the 121 Odox Motorsports car uh, applying pressure. Uh, Alvadea, uh, oh, there we go. Never mind. Uh, Hillebrand, though, directly ahead and defending that position in the Honda. The Honda's not particularly strong in a straight line. And so it's kind of why it struggles with this track, but it's one that will go better on some of the tighter, twistier the tracks. And it's lovely to see the Honda and SX as well. I think uh, you've mentioned in a previous broadcast that we've done together, it's a, a car that we don't particularly see very often in ACC eSport competition. A beautiful looking and sounding car it is the Honda NSX GT3 Evo. So great to see Hildebrand doing a solid job just inside the top 20 at this moment in time in the number in the red uh, number 94 NSX currently 20th position and one of the highest runners for 
Honda so far in this race. And as you say, doesn't necessarily suit Monza. I dare say, won't be particularly good at Paul Ricard either. But maybe as the season progresses, the Nürburgring and Barcelona will see that a little bit closer to the points paying positions. Interesting there to see that uh, Abladeo Camins, uh, there you go, try, try number two, uh, driving with VR. Now, this is kind of one of the things we see a lot of the drivers um, driving with triple screens. We've seen some with single. This is the beautiful thing of being able to see in and see the setups of various drivers. Driving with VR, um, you know, obviously you're, you're a part of the car. You can see everything around you. You're, you're very much in and amongst the action. So it's actually quite easy in a sense once you get used to it to pick things apart. Although one thing that I will say is that in the middle of summer, which we are approaching uh, quite quickly, that could become quite uncomfortable because you think of it this way, like you've got a screen to your head, it gets hot, right? That, like right now, great. But the further we get in the season, I wonder how much that's going to play, especially in the endurance rounds, the proper big one, like you know, 24 at Spa. And that's a really, really good point. Anybody that's watching at home that's tried virtual reality, the benefits and the uh, visual immersion of it is beyond question. It's a wonderful, wonderful technology and will continue to get better as the technology matures in the weeks, months and years ahead. But yes, it's very warm indeed. This is not <laughs> seeming to hold him back at this stage. I hope for his sake, based in Spain as well, which is normally a pretty warm country at the best of times. Let's hope he's got several very large fans pointing towards him to try and keep him cool because you lose your cool in a race like this. Mistakes will creep in. Mistakes will cost you time, will cost you track position and eventually will cost you points as well. So uh, a brave decision to be using VR at this stage of the race, but the enjoyment factor, no doubt, is through the roof. Yeah, you get sort of, you just get used to it. And so then, yeah. you know, taking off the VR, like the, it's the same that you get used to a single screen. Actually getting used to triples is quite hard. But then, you know, if you ever are on triples and you have to go back to a single screen, no, sorry, that is not a, a, a method you quite like to go on. Uh, Kronka, by the way, is pulled out from Chris Herker, but the race lead is coming down bit by bit. There are not many times on commentating on Josh Rogers, I can tell you that he has been caught lap after lap by a driver, but that is certainly happening now. The Salvo is absolutely firing on all cylinders right now and that Ferrari closing in on the Porsche we're going to see a tussle here at Monza before we reach that checker flag that is absolutely for sure probably even in the next sort of 10-15 minutes yeah fantastic performance here from Giovanni Di Salvo second position at the moment is close the gap down to one and a half seconds so it's making one two tenths of a second per lap in roads in a Josh Rogers ahead of him fresh in the car of course for this stint and Di Salvo has I don't really want to say a point to prove, but a little bit of a point to prove after uh, a difficult start to the sprint series last time out, not quite making the podium when teammate David Tanitza took the race victory. So uh, De Salvo was, is very much redeeming himself with flying colours so far in this race and mature and fast performance from the FDA Esports Ferrari driver. Second position, he can start to smell the virtual exhaust smoke from the Coanda Simsport for Porsche 911 ahead. And I think as well, we're getting a little bit of traffic starting to play into the situation as well. So Gianni Di Salvo, the man on the move, look how close it is now. The camera angle makes the gap look a little bit smaller than it is in reality. But Gianni Di Salvo very much on the forward charge. And as you say, uh, Lewis, four, five, six laps, this is going to be a fight worth watching. Yeah, especially with that lap traffic. That is Tarek Gamel, who's becoming a part of it. Remember back to uh, us doing commentary just a couple of days ago on uh, uh, at Brands Hatch in the Asia Esports Championship, where I, I didn't think the traffic was going to play that much of a feature in the race. And boy, oh boy, did it play uh, its part in the race. And I almost get the feeling that over a three-hour race, we may see traffic uh, playing its part into this lead battle as Tarek Gamel, I believe, getting out of the way of Josh Rogers before they reach Lesmo 1. There they go. There's the switch. There's now car between them potentially a little bit of time lost uh, by the way just getting word that we had the fastest or a, a personal best rather lap from martin cronker so approaching the halfway point of the race he is absolutely lighting up trying to gap uh for third position chris herker directly behind yeah good drive so far by cronker now 
I want to ask you a question, Lewis. Uh, put yourself in the, the mindset and the seat of a driver in this race. When you're coming into a traffic scenario, even if that traffic steps out of the way nice and early and easy for you, how does that affect your, your momentum? How does that affect, does it take you out of the zone of what you're doing? And for someone like uh, De Salvo in second, ooh, that's a late breaking maneuver if ever I've seen one. And, by pure chance and good fortune and Terry Gamble stamping on the stopping pedal that didn't turn into significant bit of contact but uh, yeah does it take you out of your zone when you're tra lap lapping traffic or can you make it work to your advantage it depends how much experience you've got in endurance racing if you're more set on uh, sprint racing if you're more set on the idea of you know touring car racing or or racing in um say for example uh with josh rogers i know he's got plenty of endurance racing experience don't get me wrong but like uh, if he was only driving in like the the porsche sports super cup um like things like that like yeah i actually think the lap traffic will cause a problem the thing is with josh with uh I I'm, I'm sure it's the same with tanitza and desalvo and that lot is that when they've been racing around in in this kind of racing in this sort of environment time and time again you get used to it and when you are well experienced with endurance racing you, lap traffic yeah it's fine yeah good, yeah you'll get out of my way that's fine i you, you're focused on what you're doing not what they're doing whereas when you're brand new to it when you're first coming across a couple of lap cars and you're under a lot of pressure and you're fairly inexperienced you more focus as we see another one going over the uh, the beach there on the exit of Ascari you more focus on the car that you're lapping which is such a mistake don't focus on them focus on what you're doing and they will hop out of the way if you kind of get where I'm coming from so it depends on entirely on experience yeah, fantastic, fantastic insight there. And these are all the kind of things that Gianni De Salvo, we're trying to leverage to his advantage. As Tuesday Deck now, we're looking in 16th position so far. This is his first stint in the race, first stint in the car today in the Lamborghini. Is Tuskovic in 16th place, doing a good job so far. They've had a little bit of drama surrounding this cars over the course of the last hour and a half worth of racing. 16th place, halfway up top 20 and i'm sure he'll be looking at ways to find a way past the five cars ahead of him and get himself in contention for points as we're just about three minutes away from hitting the halfway marker in what has been by no imagination whatsoever nothing like an endurance race but just like a really long sprint race with everybody fighting absolutely tooth and nail it's been fantastic to see so far yeah, the highest of high intensities. You may see it as endurance racing, part of the, the name and uh, part of the idea. But three hours, believe me, is a proper sprint. They are firing as hard as they can. And the thing is, in sim racing these days, uh, when it comes to endurance racing, even if it's 24 hours long, 12, 3, 4, 6, whatever it is, it, the le and it's the same thing in motorsport as well, of course, the level of perfection required is almost incalculable. Like you can do thousands of laps of practice, but when you're in the race, you need to hit every single apex. Everything in the pit lane needs to be nailed. All of your racing needs to be perfect and on the dot, especially if you're racing at this kind of level to make the most of it. And that's what these, uh, you know, a lot of these drivers with their experience, that is what they excel at. Uh, it is really pushing the boundaries. And that's where you get race engineers and all that that really are in your ear and helping you out uh, and really just sort of pushing your car bit by bit just further and further. By the way, when it comes to the pit stop sequence, anyone just joining in, uh, we are approaching the halfway point of the race, but the final pit stop we are expecting uh, between uh, an hour and five minutes to go and 55 minutes to go, courtesy of the pit sequence, which I will say there is one car that I kind of wanted to touch on in this, which is actually the car directly behind Tushkovich that's currently on screen, Tobias Pfeffer, who is behind the wheel of the 157 um, RHG car, is that they have that crash they were part of that crash um with the help racing squad and uh, g2e sports on this stretch of road but because of where that crash happened and when it happened they came into the pit lane with two hours and 10 minutes to go in the race which does actually mean that as long as their cars are right they still fit into the pit window so they're not actually outside of it which means they're not going to breach the regulations if they're a bit lucky with when the race ends yeah, that's uh, something that they'll be furiously calculating back at base for that team. And that just, again, 
You touched upon it just then, Lewis, about having somebody in your ear, a race engineer, a driver coach, I know, is also in the ear of the Ferrari Driver Academy drivers, for example. So the mental capacity that you have got to have as a driver at a top level in a championship like this, not only are you driving the car, but you're also absorbing data that's given to you. You're working out where you can find an advantage. You're managing the car, you're managing the race, you're managing your rivals around you. You're carrying out instructions that your team are issuing to you. It's more than just driving the car, isn't it? It's managing the whole endurance race experience. And then also, of course, even earlier in the proceedings, is finding a setup that both yourself and your teammate are comfortable with in the car for the duration of however long the right race may be. So it's a beautiful thing is endurance racing and each and every one of our drivers are doing a spectacular job of showcasing our sport and of course the SRO family of eSport events that we've got running throughout the course of this year. Yeah, a reminder that, of course, setups are wide open in the championship, so they can do as they wish with the cars. Um, uh, same with tie limits, etc. They uh, they just do as they wish and uh, uh, see how things unfold for them, which for some drivers, I mean, some drivers prefer a fixed setup championship or a semi-fixed setup championship where there's less control on the driver and it's more about what you're doing behind the wheel rather than what you know about the car. But then, you know, other ways, you, you switch it one way and the other. Josh Rogers pulling out uh, the race lead. It's now 1.6 seconds, so it's extended a little bit as he started uh, going faster and faster. Martin Kronker's uh, swift increase of pace seems to have dissipated straight away as the 22 is right on the rear end of him for the podium battle, but they have departed the Ferrari of Pavlovsky uh, directly behind. With uh, all of the race engineers and stuff, how do you find it, like having a lot of people in your ear? Can you drive with people in your ear or, or is that a no-go? I can drive with people in my ear, but I prefer not to. I yeah. prefer to, to get... It depends who's talking to you. If you're getting concise two, three, four word instructions, absolutely fine. But I've also raced with people that like to tell me a story. And I just, <laughs> when we, when too many words, too many words, which is ironic for me because I use lots of words to say simple things. But too many words is too many. I like to know exactly what I need to know, when I need to know it, and then leave me. As Kimi Räikkönen says, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. But sadly, in my case, I don't know what I'm doing. So that's why I talk about it rather than drive nowadays. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I'm um, sort of in the same boat. I can't drive if someone's in my ear, unless it is very much to the point of yeah. go faster, pit now, something like that. I'm fine. Any other information, I go. I'm really, really not very good. It needs to just be like me and the car and just attack. And that's where these drivers are so good. Is that if you watch them, particularly like. Uh, you know, drivers like Niels Nyox or whatever, that they're they're, ju they're just having a conversation with someone basically whilst driving. Yeah. And it's like, wow, I mean, um, Yaroslav Honzik is uh, like King Rossi. He does streaming and whatever. Uh, not driving today in the Yaz Heat car, but I have seen him in chat. Um, he will just drive and casually have a conversation with the team and his uh, audience as well. Like that, I don't know how you can do that and be ridiculously fast. The two, to me, don't go hand in hand. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree with that one. And that's why these drivers are some of the finest drivers in Europe in virtual competition. And they're showing themselves to be that good just this moment in time. But Martin Kronker now, very much a man under pressure. Chris Herker really starting to get a bit of a wiggle on in fourth position. So Herker now starting his charge, his run up the order. He fancies that podium position. Of course, this will be the final stint for Kronker. He will hand over his car to to teammate uh, Samir Ibrahimi at the end of this stint, I think. And uh, Chris Herker pushing, pushing, pushing. It's a danger zone now for these two Porsches. Of course, Herker wants the position. They need to be careful not to hold each other up. Kamal Pavlovsky not a million miles away in arrears in fifth position as well. But uh, while they're doing that one, the fight at the front of the field continues to stretch out as we're seeing a couple of... Uh, there's a couple of Audis going side by side. Oh, is that a Lamborghini? Yes, yeah, an Italian Audi, same thing. Going side by side through the first chicane. And that is Ezekiel in 15th position on the outside. That is a Rognikov on the inside. Can a Rognikov complete the overtaking manoeuvre as we run down into the second chicane? Both cars running side by side. A little bit of contact. Nothing to complain about. Great overhead shot there. A Rognikov, a little bit of a hip and shoulder. Thankfully, the Ezekiel keeps the car, stays on the tarmac, and uh, Igor Rognikov takes the place. Hard won, but won fairly. I don't 
I don't really want to be mean and drop you under this, but I believe that is actually Tushkovic, uh, who's in that Lamborghini. But um, that uh, was an intense fight. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I also, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I feel really bad now, but um, a, a, good, a good move either way uh, and, and sorted up there, but a little bit, little bit aggressive, feisty. It's almost more aggressive and more feisty down the order than it is up here. Because look at these two Porsches. They're, they're close, they're battling. They're battling hard in a sense, but they're not, you know, there's no contact, there's respect, there's calm between them. And they're battling for the podium, they're battling for the big boy stuff. A lot of that one as well is that these drivers know the championship points on offer. They know a good championship points at that one. Of course you want the position, of course you want the podium place. But also, it's a long championship, quite literally, being an endurance series. And if you can come away with a third, a fourth, even a fifth position from the opening race of the season when everything's new, everybody's new to each other, there's some new team combinations, Monza is a, is a danger circuit at the best of times. You can't really turn your nose up at that. It's not worth taking too much of a risk for the sake of just one position and the three points that come with it. So I'm sure that plays in the mind of these drivers, even at this relatively early stage in the uh, proceedings, whereas the Tuskovic, Arognikov, etc., etc. region outside of the points is a little bit more risk that's worth taking because 12th is as good as 22nd. It still pays out nothing at the end of the race. Yeah, absolutely. So just experience and might as well have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, be it believe, by the way, we did cut back very briefly to Equisi in the 32 uh, Audi. I uh, believe there was a bit more of an issue that we just cut away from in that sense, but it was just departing Ascari, uh, having an issue for the Team WRT uh, by SDL Esports. So not ideal in that scenario. But either way, when we focus on the battle for third place, I think this might be Chris Hooker's best opportunity to get by the VRS Commander Simpson man, although the straight line speed, I think it, like this this would obviously just be through setup in the sense that you know, they're both Porsches, so you can attack things differently, less wing, etc, etc. Um, you know, close off the brake ducts a little bit more and try and make it a bit more poking and straight, although you'd be brave to do that um, around here with the heavy braking zones. It does seem that Chris Hooker does not have the straight line speed to pass the VRS Commander car. And I would wager that that is the learnings that VRS Kwanda have taken from yesterday's sprint race. The car was a little bit short on straight line speed compared to some of the rivals, David Tanitza in particular in the Ferrari. So it looks like they've taken that, the understanding that they've got from that, maybe wound a little bit of downforce off, done something to the car to give it a little bit more terminal velocity at the end of the straight. And quite frankly, Martin Kronka will be grateful of that at this moment in time because that is the difference between him wearing the uh, Chris Herker car and just keeping a few tenths of a second gap between the two of them. But I've got to admit, Lewis, this has got an air of the inevitable about it at the moment. Herker is not just a little bit faster, but significantly faster than the number three car, the third position car at this stage in the race. Look at that for a shot. Oh, absolutely stunning. And yeah, you'll be able to see him just poke out in the, uh, in the mirror there. But yeah, I, I do get that vibe as well, that Herker is, is the faster of the two at the moment but believe me you will not find many teams that work as hard as well there we go going around the outside i don't think that one's going to work maybe going for a later apex and try and line up a little bit better for a better run uh down into the first chicane but you won't find a team that will exit a race and instantly do their homework as hard as coanda because i mean they are arguably across sim racing as an entirety so when you include all of the platforms you will not find many teams that are as proficient across all of the platforms that are at the front uh, in as many as this team. They are arguably the biggest team in sim racing in that sense, and you're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Believe me, they have done their research. They may be new to the Assetto Corsa Competizione platform, but they know what they are doing. They know how to win races, and they know how to win championships. And trust me, they would have looked at, at yesterday's race as a learning opportunity, and like you say, they would have seen that, oh, we're struggling in straight line speed. What do we do about that? How do we attack that? What do we do? And they will attack it full on to find what advantage they can. And at the moment, as you were saying, oh, that's a great insight again there from, uh, from Lewis McGlade. Chris, uh, Martin Kronka, sorry, seems to have got a little bit of an advantage now over Chris Herker. So just a lap ago, Herker all over the back of the VRS Coanda Simsport car now dropped a few tenths of a second away. But talking about fluctuating gaps, Gianne De Salvo, 1.2 
tenths of a second away from the race lead and Josh Rogers will of course be giving over the car at the end of his stint at around 20 minutes time or so Ferrari have the choice of keeping De Salvo in or swapping him out with race starter David Tanitza depending on how their vibe is going but uh, that'll be interesting to see Josh Rogers the race leading car with a different driver for the first time of this race and can they maintain the pressure and the pace that has been displayed so far in this race I did say that they should keep Tanitza in the car and you know De Salvo uh, you know maybe wait until the last minute because Tanitza was right on pace uh, I, I can confirm by looking at the lap times they're pretty much identical between um, De Salvo and Tanitza they are lapping on the money on the same dot and so this could actually show how important it was for um, Kronker uh, to, to hold off um, Tanitza in the early stages of the race. It was really, really important. That's where you're maybe dropping back and then the position switch happened. Like all that, considering it was like seven seconds uh, as Josh Rogers has got a fair amount of traffic on circuit at the moment that seems to be holding him up. Uh, no way for Josh Rogers to pass at the moment. He's going to look to the inside at Lesmo 1 and instantly clear uh, the Aston Martin. But uh, yeah, Rogers under pressure a lot now time seems to be dropping away and the ferrari is going from strength to strength yeah we spoke about the beginning of this little sequence it was a 1.2 second gap it's much less than that now you can see with the naked eye Gianni de salvo will be hoping that the car ahead gets out of the way gets off the racing line before oscar it's going to cost De salvo if he has to follow the aston through this section of corners which he does De salvo having to be a little bit cautious on the throttle he'll have less downforce behind the car goes to the beach again a little bit but nothing major blue flags are waving now so that aston martin needs to acknowledge he has got one of the race leaders behind him at this stage of the race but doesn't seem to recognize the ferrari it's not conceding position very slow through parabolic a little bit squirrely as well for good measure De salvo now stays nice and calm but will be frustrated and a bit of an opportunity lost there not lost too much can still see the race leading josh rogers ahead of him the gap winds back up again to about a second or so between the two cars but make no mistake ladies and gentlemen this is very very much game on for the race lead with an hour and 19 minutes and a potential driver swap still to go certainly a pit stop maybe a driver swap for the ferrari definitely a driver swap for the porsche so porsche and ferrari front of the field ah, that sounds nice great fight continuing yeah that was the gtwr academy car and uh, just a bit of a note because we I, like there is an extensive rule book uh, for this championship and i have been through it ever so slightly but um it's it is a lot uh, and the drivers should all and this is always thing if you're a driver you go through the rule book you understand what you're playing with uh blue flags in this scenario uh, of course it's it's the responsibility of the lapping car to get by in this scenario blue flags don't mean you have to get out of the way it just means that you cannot defend and that a faster car is coming so in that sense the the the, the gtwr academy car didn't do anything wrong it was just doing what it did and as soon as uh, the you know uh, say for example in telesmo one as soon as josh rogers got to the inside just didn't fight it which is right that is by the rule book absolutely spot on i'd say in a sense it does seem that the time has been cost uh, to an almost equal amount between the 18 and the 51 as uh, we've also got Tarek Gamel who will now play his part in this battle for third position uh, it's Porsche v Ferrari at the front it's Porsche v Porsche for third and that is continuing as very very little time separates these two yeah but another Aston Martin going a lap down the battle for third both cars as one clear Tarek Gamel not making life difficult for the race leaders get himself off the racing line for the run down into the parabolic of Chris Herker probably be a little bit frustrated at that maybe was hoping that would present an opportunity for the German driver but Herker now has a good run off the parabolic immediately in the slipstream of Martin Kronker ahead not closing the gap as much as he would like there's more speed as we said before in the VRS Coanda car but Kronker goes to the defensive immediately Terry Gamble trying not to get too heavily involved not close enough Chris Herker and he's just it he must be so frustrating for Chris Herker he's, he's got the overall lap speed but not fast enough in the parts of the track that he needs to be to get an overtake pulled off on the car ahead and Oh, as a driver, keeping you cool, not trying to find lap time that you know doesn't exist. Somewhere out on the racetrack and dropping it is so, so easy at this stage.
But yeah, I, I, I kind of wonder, this is where you know, your final pit stop and when you take it is going to be really, really crucial. Chris Urquhart could stay behind the wheel of the car and carry it to the chequered flag, uh, or he can pass a uh, uh, relinquished control of the car, same as in the sense of the Salvo, uh, can relinquish the car to his teammates. Obviously, they have already had a driver swap. Uh, and so for, for Herka, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. It doesn't really matter in that sense. The, the actual point is potentially pitting closer to the hour and five minute mark. Although, again, I just want to say they have to be careful with that as there is a potential for a move here with Herka closing in. I don't think he's brave enough to try something here uh, into Ascari. You have to remember that it is a 65 minute stint limit. Which means, say, for example, if you do your, if you pit with 65 minutes to go, or you come out of the pit, which is actually how it works. If you come out of the pits with 65 minutes to go, you have to hope that you cross the check that the line to finish the race bang on 65 minutes, which is obviously not what happens all the time. If Josh Rogers closes on the line with um, you know a couple of seconds to go, you've got to have uh, you know a, around two minutes in hand to that that check of flag to that stint time. Otherwise, you're going to be in big big trouble. Oh, and make no mistake, these teams will be working to such a fine margin as well that they will be using that margin to the absolute extremity of what they can get away with in order to find a little bit of advantage as well. So really, really interesting stuff. It'll be great to see how the different drivers, and of course, Samir Abrami, don't forget, who is uh, Chris Herker's teammate in the fourth place portion at the moment, a very fast driver in his own right, was, was outstanding in the SRO AM Championship just a season ago as well. Really great performances from the German driver in that car. So Samir Abrami knows what he's doing. Chris Herker knows what he's doing as well. A, a very enviable lineup actually in the number 22 G Picks racing by Ren Welton Porsche. So yeah, it, it, I think it all depends on how the individual drivers feel at any given time as to which one you would want in your car to close out this race. And no doubt those kinds of conversations are being had back at team bases. They're deciding who's going to finish up this race. But we've got one hour, 14 minutes and 25 for three seconds left on the clock as we're looking now at Nicholas Hildebrand and back to Chris Herker once again on the attack. Yeah, uh, the thing is, when it comes to their, their driver sequence and stuff, is that with very specific exceptions, they know exactly what they're doing with when they're switching drivers out, because they'll know that, oh, he'll start the race, he'll, he'll go second, he'll start the race, he'll go second. As we can see, uh, Nicholas Hillebrand uh, currently on screen. Uh, normally, as you can see, actually, by his T-shirt, uh, part of the Butler Powell Motorsport Squad, uh, uh, Rene Butler's team, and so he's been a part of that outfit for a while. Uh, still defending at the moment, joining the HPD squad at the moment in the Honda for this championship. Battle for third continues. Is this close enough? I do get the vibe that even with the slipstream, that run down into turn one may not work out for Chris Herger, but this is as close as he's been. This is the potential move. He's at the inside and he has to send it now. Does not feel confident in doing so. And you have to ask the question, why not? Well, sensible driving though from Herc, we've seen many drivers in the history of real and virtual motorsports making a bit of a close your eyes and hope for the best lunge into any given braking zone. So Herc, wise enough to know that despite a good run, didn't quite have enough of the overlap to make it worth his time as Marek Shins now, eighth position under pressure into the same sequence of corner, the Retifilio T1 at Monza, a very famous section of corners, often provides plenty of drama and Marek Shins doing everything he can to defend from Eamon Murphy in ninth position, Luca Burke a little bit further back still holding on to the final points paying position and uh, Tony Baroli I think that is in the number 80 Lamborghini just at the front of this fight so seven, eight and nine as one out on the circuit this is becoming a very intense fight indeed and Baroli will try everything he can to stay clear of the very quick Marek Shins and the very hungry Eamon Murphy behind. Yeah, Bioni taken over the car from uh, uh, Mike Noble. I did, we did have questions about that Lamborghini that was running up in fifth uh, earlier in the race. The questions were, uh, was that Lamborghini starting to struggle a little bit as the race went on? Certainly seems as that is the case, considering it is the highest place Lamborghini. They are the benchmark in that sense. As there's Shintz, there's Eamon Murphy going down to Ascari around the outside. Oh, you don't get a much better than that. What a display between the two. And for Yaz Heat, up into eighth place, that 
with with an hour and 11 minutes to go, I think may well be in contention for move of the race. Sensational stuff from the Irishman. Yeah, absolutely outstanding. Standing ovation moment there for Eamon Murphy. Plenty of bravery, plenty of skill, plenty of racecraft as well. And the result, the reward is a position gain. So eighth position for Murphy. Shins drops down into ninth. Peroni just ahead, trying to hang on in. As you say, the fastest, the highest placed of the Lamborghini runners at this moment in time in seventh position. But Eamon Murphy found some lap time in that McLaren is making great use of it so far in this race. Murphy, of course, double stinted at the moment. So it's his second stint in the car. He will be handed over in probably 10, 15 minutes or so to... Oh, no, sorry, I tell a lie. Capoccia started the car. So this is Murphy's first stint behind the Yazzie 720S GT3. So great driving from Murphy and Shins. Now I'll be wondering what happened. How did that happen? And can I do something about it in the next hour and 10? And do you know what's going to happen here? Well, look who's, uh, look who's directly behind this 191 <laughs> Bentley. Oh, yeah, here we go. The battle's going to return to what we saw over the entire first hour of the race as the number 23 Rocket Simsport car is there. And remember when we did see that battle, also a part of that was Attila Dench, who is closing in in that BS competition BMW. So this is going to be a tight fight, obviously for a position of high importance in the sense that this is points paying positions this is important stuff this is what we are out here fighting for so they really need to nail the next hour and 10 minutes finding some pace at the moment on the road by the way when we were talking about that battle for the race lead josh rogers is going purple at the moment in the first sector so he has been trying to run away uh, it was purple on the, for the first sector on the last lap he is building up some speed in this portion. He's trying to break the salvo. But every time they seem to ask a question, the Ferrari behind answers and answers with with some some uh, some pace as well. Yeah, it's a high-speed game of chess at the front of the field. One driver moves, the other one reacts, and they remain. 1.4 seconds separated the two of them as the uh, we see Honda there getting very squiggly indeed but keeping it on the black stuff that's Nicholas Hildebrand so far just about keeping control of the car but that puts him under pressure from the chasing pack goes defensive into Ascari he's beyond the wrong line now caught oh, no. between the two cars Hildebrand goes round and round and round and that is a very disappointing conclusion to that manoeuvre all started with a little twitch for Nicholas Hildebrand contact with the following Audi both cars rejoined at pace back onto the racetrack be careful with the rejoin and messy 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 high speed contact yeah uh, the Odox Motorsport Audi has already been in trouble with race controllers now Jota uh, going to get involved in this with Robbie Stapleford the young man getting involved and trying to move up a position obviously damage on the two cars he's battling with Hillebrand uh, did hit the wall quite hard there uh, into a scar I'm sure we'll take another look at that because it was uh, a fairly tight bit of contact between the two it's the question as to whether Hillebrand was squeezing a little bit too much or whether the Odox Motorsport guy that uh, was was just a little bit too pushy you can see See how angry Hillebrand is as oh there's another move and that is MCW Racing Team Tiziano Brioni losing a position potentially losing a second one that was around the outside I believe of Ascari this time from Shins and there is Luca Burke through as well Ha <laughs> ha, fantastic stuff with an hour and eight minutes left on the clock. Luca Burke, the silent assassin, slowly but surely creeping his way up the top ten. Fantastic bit of driving from all three of those. So the Lamborghini loses two positions in one corner. Marek Shins in the Bentley remains in eighth position. Luca Burke in ninth. Barola drops down to tenth. Attila Dench still slowly but surely creeping up onto this fight as well. And hey up, we've seen this one before. The Bentley and the McLaren, nose yeah. to tail. Hello. We're start again. This is two hours ago. Relive. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're seeing an action replay uh, <laughs> unfolding, uh, unfolding in the best quality possible live television uh, as, as they are once again battling. I, I'm not sure why Brioni's quite as slow uh, as he was. Obviously, his teammates with uh, Mike Noble. Um, uh, I think Noble might be back behind the wheel. Uh, to sort of switch uh, on the next pit stop. But I think they might drop out of the points before that point because Attila Dench is now right on the back. Of course, Dench will get out of the car 
uh, on the pit stop, passing it over to uh, a, a, you know somewhat real world racer, as you said before, Angus Fender. Uh, he's done his fair amount of real world racing, bit in GT GT4s, whatever. Like he's done so much uh, in that sense, and I'm sure he'll be watching his teammate very, very closely. Uh, and came second in the British GT Esports, uh, did Fender. So. Um, yeah, I, I think he might be on a bit of a march this car, and I don't see it finishing outside of the points, do you? No, they've been uh, very much on the fringes of those points, as you mentioned, and Angus Fender, very impressive driver, was great value for money when we saw him in the British GT Championship, and to the there fight, is. very nice indeed, to uh, James Baldwin, the eventual British GT Champion, and we all know that James Baldwin very much knows how to pedal a virtual car, so Attila Dench doing a great job at this moment in time, 11th place so far, very much in the slipstream of the pack ahead, and this could go one or two ways to answer directly your question, could very easily be in the points, and not only in the points, with a tasty number of those points for good measure, but also it could all very, very easily unravel if they get involved in unnecessary fights out on the racetrack. So let's watch this one, let's keep our eye on this one as the race progresses down, getting close to the final hour of the event but one thing is for sure Barone is struggling so far in that Lamborghini and seems to be the weaker of that little pike and vulnerable for an overtake from Denks. Uh, just so you can see that is Angus Fender who's currently on screen uh, so it's not Attila Dench so you know uh, they are told they have to race with wheels so mind control isn't allowed uh, <laughs> but it was clearly driving without any hands but that is uh, Angus Fender question to you then with his race suit in the background is that because it's drying or is that some sort of product placement? <laughs> be a great great idea if it is using every opportunity these racing drivers to get the brand out there <laughs> yeah absolutely fantastic to see there in the background obviously uh, all the drivers I, I do like seeing when they've got like the cameras on them uh, drivers using it and sort of inventing ways to, to get something uh, uh, there was I think the best one I saw was speaking of BS competition um, Alan Terzic uh, once had a yoga ball in the background with a sponsorship on it uh, if I remember correctly uh, this was in a different championship another time but still quite uh, quite amusing um, regardless so yeah getting inventive you've got to do what you've got to do to get the name and the brand out there this uh, eSport racing now becoming big business there's good brands involved in a 15,000 euro minimum guaranteed prize pool for this particular championship that we're looking at today the broadcasts as you spoke about earlier in the day Lewis is getting more and more professionals Attila Dench now goes to the outside on the run down into the Retifilio Baroni on the inside in the Lamborghini who will be the last of the late breakers that is the Lamborghini oh, but he breaks too late pirouettes the car makes a mistake Dench makes light contact as well Baroni needs to be very very careful wisely gets himself onto the escape road and back out onto the racetrack takes some styrofoam boards <laughs> with him as well but uh, Baroni just hustled and pressured into that mistake meanwhile in third position Chris Herker trying to find a way past once again Kronke in the second place but third place sorry fight of great intensity Herker trying to make a move as well everywhere we look all of a sudden it has come alive yeah, and what a time for it to do so, heading into that final pit stop sequence. Tobias Pfeffer into the pit lane uh, for the R8G uh, squad, of course, uh, uh, part of the, the GTD, uh, GTWR uh, team that's partnered up with R8G for these uh, events on Assetto Corsa Competizione and into the pit lane uh, for the final time. Same with Aquisi. Uh, yeah, that was a, a, a good attempt from Attila Dench, but obviously just pushing it a little bit too far was Brioni. And quite clearly, we found out what the struggle was on that Lamborghini. It did seem that the tyres were very, very much shot because just had absolutely nothing on the rear end. Clear issues uh, for them, which is a shame for the N MCW squad because uh, I say they've, they've done so well in the early stages of this race. Mike Noble doing a fantastic effort to be up inside the top five in the very early stages of the race. And unfortunately, I don't think they are going to be a four points this afternoon and uh, kind of just uh, just one of those things that uh, a big big shame but clearly getting the strategy just a little bit wrong yeah and again it all goes down to what we said earlier about you learn your lessons sometimes they're harder lessons than others but you learn those lessons and you'll take that forward as Baroni goes down pit road to hand the car over to Mike Noble so the final stop of the day for the number eight to Lamborghini is being played out as we speak Chris Herker that we're looking at still in fourth position still 
cannot find a way past that VRS Coanda Porsche. Ahead is a couple of lap cars about to come into play as well. So Chris Erker will have spotted those through his windshield. He'll be waiting for an opportunity to see if it presents itself as he closes to the back marker traffic. But Herker must be must be getting a little bit frustrated now even if it's just for personal pride he'll want to take this position out on circuit before he jumps down pit road surely but as a driver let's be honest you're you know you're you're battling it out toe-to-toe -to -toe in the same car the same machinery with one of the biggest teams in sim racing that is a good feeling regardless as to whether you win or lose and herc is one of those drivers who's uh, very much sort of takes what he can get and you know it, just in the sense of let's just go out there and enjoy what we do and what our craft is the two people that are ahead obviously battling for position that's uh, hillebrand and robbie stapleford uh, so the hbd car going up against the joe uh, uh, sport vehicle there is uh, the MCW car out of the pit lane uh, and I believe it will be uh, Mike Noble back behind the wheel but our leaderboard's not updated yet still says it's Brioni but I assume they'd switch it back as Tarek Gamel in the pit lane to serve that 15 second time penalty and hand the reins of the Williams eSports car over to Jack Keithley Yep, challenging time indeed for Tarek Gamble of the Williams eSport team. Way down the uh, almost outside of the top 30 runners by the time the pit stops wind themselves down. Van der Velde comes down pit road as well. You can see on the timing tower we're looking on board and at Robbie Stapleford in that lapped car that we spoke about. Stapleford in the McLaren just behind this McLaren and this Honda NSX fight. You can see our third and fourth place drivers. So these two heavily, heavily focused on each other. Heavily focused on the Lamborghini of Mike Noble just come out of pit road ahead as well. So this is danger time for our third and fourth place man. Can Chris Herker make something of this traffic ahead of him as we run down into the Ascara chicane neither car close enough to make any move on the traffic ahead Herker can feel this is his opportunity this is by far and away the best chance that Chris Herker has had to liberate that third position from the car ahead looking back now for Robert Stableford as uh, Lewis said earlier in the broadcast there is no need for you to jump off the racing line as a lap car it's up to the chasing pack to do something about making their way past this will be a great opportunity now for Coanda to jump down pit road and get okay. themselves out of this situation as Herker maybe he's doing just that yes he is Herker says his uh, pit stop down pit road and this could be the turning point in this fight for third yeah, had Hillebrand directly ahead of him as well as the entered pit lane. Robbie Stapleford's going to relinquish that position, uh, or not position, but the track position rather, um, to the Coanda man. So Martin Kronker uh, at least going to hang on to third position for now. We'll see if Herker uh, can hang on or maybe even gain on Kronker, gain on the Coanda Simsport car. Obviously, everyone into the pit lane did see um, that there was a drive through penalty. That was to the Odox Motorsport um, Audi. Uh, obviously for contact between himself and the HBD of Nicholas Hillebrand going down into Ascari. So again, Judication has looked at that and decided it'd be the fault uh, of the Audi. Um, so uh, Albaladeo uh, Camin's going to be into the pit lane to serve a drive-through, uh, potentially on the other side of a penalty. Oh, he's already served the penalty, so he's already done that. Has to come in, though, and serve his final pit stop of the afternoon. So second drive-through for Odox Motorworks. They are not going to be popular with race control. <laughs> yes, there will be uh, some, shall we say, conversations being had when the dust settles on this opening race of the season. But I'm very, very interested now to see if the undercut is successful here at the final part of this race, the final pit stops of this race. That fight for third position was not going to get resolved out on the circuit, so they've decided to do something a little bit different as Chris Erker jumped down pit road nice and early. Will he come out? in clear air that is a massive question that we need to answer but while he's got fresh boots on that car this is the opportunity to throw down some competitive laps and try because don't forget the vrs coanda car will have a brand new driver in for the race try and leverage that experience and that speed to get that last step of the podium to yourself 
Speaking of, by the way, VRS Commander, it's half a second for the race lead. What has been happening with Josh Rogers? He has been losing a bit of time and had a failed uh, a, a lap time over the previous run as we see the GTWR car diving it to the inside of Lucas Kreutzer, who's currently driving the Sidemax Motorworks car. So both these drivers new into the cars for the race. There's a little bit of contact nearly between the two cars, but the Aston Martin from GTWR RHG Academy should be gaining the position. That's the Haupt Racing uh, number four car as well coming through the middle of all of that but they are, I believe, a lap down on this after that enormous crash between themselves and G2 Esports uh, on the run down to Ascari. We're deep in the pit stop sequence, Attila Dench into the pit lane, Egger also uh, not sure as to whether Josh Rogers is as well. I believe they're staying out at least a little bit, but they do need to come into the pit lane soon. We're approaching the very, very last moment for them to be out on circuit. Yeah, great drama, great drama out of it here on circuit. Great to see the Mercedes as well back out on the racetrack after that enormous accident earlier in the race. But this is Gianni Di Salvo, second position for the FDA Academy eSport team, all over the back of the race leader of Josh Rogers. So Di Salvo finding time, finding track position ahead of his rival now all the way to the rear of the Coanda portion. Now, can De Salvo make the overtake? Will either or both of these drivers jump down pit lane at this stage? No, they do not. They go past pit entry. There's De Salvo Ooh. makes the stop, but Rogers continues in race lead. Johnny De Salvo takes his final stop of the day. Okay, just to clarify, by the way, because they can do that. Oh, there's contact there between the Hat Racing car and the Sidemax Motorworks. Lucas Kreutzer, that was a lapped car just getting in the way. And uh, yeah, just making a little bit of contact as entering the pit lane, a little bit of a flash from uh, hits. Uh, not being a fan of being hit in that scenario. But yeah, just to clarify, the stint limit uh, is uh, uh, 65 minutes. And that is the time out of the pit lane, not time in the car. So in that sense, they would have done the calculations at VRS Command and Simsport and uh, judged that they will potentially be all right. They'll be coming into the pit lane just at the right time to see through the pit stop sequence. Uh, interesting to see that, though. And we do know that the VRS commander, at least on the last stop, was slower in the pit lane by quite a bit than the Ferrari that's fighting with them. So interesting call for VRS commander. I think this is going to be a little bit tight. Needs to be a perfect lap from the Australian now living in Germany. Yeah, this is going to be very tight, as tight as you can get it at the front of the field. As you say, they need to be inch perfect, stopping the car in the pit spot, going down to speed limit at the absolute maximum allowed by the regulations. Going to get off the limiter as early as possible on pit exit, nail the in lap, nail the out lap, nail the stop itself and just hope that Gianna Di Salvo hasn't found the speed on his outlap in the number 51 Ferrari. Di Salvo indeed has stayed in that car, so David Tenitsa not jumping back in to the FDA Ferrari as Josh Rogers now comes through the Parabolica and into, I would expect, pit road. Yes, he does. Down pit lane, late as you can late can be, on the brakes, onto the pit lane speed limiter. The Honda ahead won't get in the way. He'll not be worried about that one at all as the VRS driver makes his final stop of the day. Oh, Tanitza is actually behind the wheel. I say, did switch drivers. It's just updated on our tower now that uh, Tanitza is back behind the wheel of the 51. Uh, between the two of them, though, I, I said it earlier and I will say it again and hammer home that point. The speed differential between Tanitza and De Salvo is absolutely minimal. There is very, very little between them. So let's take a look at what happened between the Sidemax Motorworks car and the Haupt Racing Squad down into the uh, final corner of the Parabolica. I think the Forge is a little bit light on the brakes. The Ferrari may be over doing it, although he didn't miss the corner. Of course, a lap difference between those two cars. So Rogers, Kronka, Pavlovsky into the pit lane. Shins will also join as well with Tushkovich and Tanitza will retake what we think might be second place, but could potentially be the race lead dependent on when Pash Gergis is going to take over the 18 car where they come out of the pit lane. There he is, Greek man behind the wheel of the car. Looks good for now. It does indeed, but Tanitza, of course, has got the advantage of maximum speed down the straight. The Porsche has got to get up to racing speed. You can see in there, blue flags wave traffic involved as well. Darren Tanitza, can he take the race lead oh. side by side in the braking zone? Tanitza gets it done before the braking zone, before the apex, and by the closest, closest of margins, David Tanitza, the Ferrari Driver Academy eSport team, retake the race lead. Pashgurgis in second position for VRS Coanda Sim sport lost the race lead they have held for the entirety of the race and now 
Gracious first time behind the wheel against the Formula One eSports world champion and the winner of the race yesterday. This is going to be a titanic battle in the last 52 minutes. But you've put, yeah, potential. I mean, Pash is a, is a monstrously fast driver and well equipped with endurance racing, but you've put effectively your second driver in the car to try and battle one of Sim Racing's best. And that's where the difficulty lies in this scenario for the 18 VRS Koana Sim Sport. A bit of a note they lost, I think it was around about five seconds on the first stop. On this stop, it was slightly under two seconds, around 1.5, 1.6 seconds lost to the VRS Koanda spot. Interesting to see that they continue to lose time in pit lane uh, uh, to their rivals. They they didn't lose much yesterday, as as far as we're aware. Uh, but but here today, for whatever reason, the they're not they're not fast in pit lane. And that is something that, as you mentioned before, they're a very hard-working team. They'll take that knowledge away. They'll work on it over the break between now and Paul Ricard on the 5th of June. And no doubt come back with that little hole in their armoury well and truly plugged. But that's the future. Now for today, David Tanitsa, having got the warmer tyres of the two drivers because he's a courtesy of being out for a lap longer, has started to build a gap. And this is exactly what he needs to do. Kyrgios is just getting used to the car the track conditions, his rivals bringing everything up to speed and is at a bit of a disadvantage compared to what he will be in, say, five, ten minutes' time. So this is David Tanitz's golden moment to start pushing, building some kind of advantage and giving himself a little bit of a safety net at the front of the field. But this is... So this scenario, Lewis, that's happened just now is exactly why endurance racing is awesome. A high-speed game of chess all the way to the very final throw the dice and then look we've got a race on in the last 50 minutes also a bit of a note that chris herker has got by collins who's taken over uh, from martin Kronka in the vrs coanda squad um but either way then the 22 out ahead and out onto the podium by five seconds as well so it's not one of the vrs coanda cars that's struggling it is both of them as we see denis grabowski uh, teammate of yiga rogorognikov uh, trying to attack for a position on the 130 lamborghini on that run uh, into the first combat Complex. It's going to be a little bit tight between the two and the tussle continues. The 41 going for the undercut completely misjudges it and spins the Lamborghini out. I think he might be trying to wait, but race control will be right on his heels shortly. Yeah, messy bit of driving there from both drivers into the Retifilio chicane. Dugoboski trying to make a way past the Lamborghini, not willing to concede, and unfortunately when an immovable object hits a force that will not go anywhere at all, somebody has to go backwards, and sadly that was the Lamborghini. Capaccia now, we're looking at back in the car as well, so... Uh, Capaccia, we wondered if he'd get back in the car after serving the first stint and doing a great job well inside the top 10 in 8th position at this moment in time fighting that Lamborghini. Ciclar has either been racing with or against somebody in close proximity for the entire three hours as Capaccia oh. goes for a day at the beach in Monza, decides going to a motor race is more fun, so Lee's post haste and gets back onto the racetrack a little bit further back. Michael O'Brien takes over from Tarek Gamel in ninth position in the fellow McLaren, the Rocket Sim Sport car. O'Brien in ninth, Angus Fender, British GT, eSports and real world star in tenth and the last of the points holders at this moment in time at least. Michael O'Brien seeming to struggle a bit there as he uh, opens the door. The 55 there is a car a lap down. That will be Jack Keith, I believe, behind the wheel of the Williams Esports car. And you've got the Odox Motorsports uh, vehicle as well, that blue and black uh, Audi. So a lot of lap traffic around Michael O'Brien that you can see on your screen at the moment. And the uh, grey and blue car directly behind, uh, that one being the BS Competition vehicle that is being driven by Angus Fender. Those two teams have taken uh, uh, to the track against and with each other on countless occasions over the last few months and uh, the two team managers that are a part of it of course Rocket Sim Sports being run by Zancho and in a sense so it's uh, Edmund Trevelyan and Johnson behind the scenes there and BS Competition being Florian Harsper's uh, squad uh, those two get along they work together elsewhere in sim racing so it's a bit of a friendly battle but still with some big points up for offer for them I know it's not at the front of the field but any point in the moment on a field like this is a big point yeah, of course, you need to score points because points make prizes, as the famous English game show once used to say. And also, it's all about putting one over on your rivals as well and showing that you're somebody to be reckoned with, showing you 
teammates, your teams, other people, potential sponsors, and of course the people you're racing with, that you are someone to be reckoned with. You are a force within this championship. And O'Brien, doing a good job. This is his first stint in the Rocket Sim Sport car. Came out in ninth position. Got some fast traffic around him, which is always a, a difficult scenario to know what to do about that. The car a lap down, but very fast over the course of a lap. Do you let them go? Do you race with them? Do you try and keep them back? And Mike Noble, quick note as well, returns to the Lamborghini in 11th position. So the fight for points is very much still on for Mike Noble's team in the number 80 Lamborghini. Yeah, I think he could close it, especially considering, I, I don't know about you, I know that Michael O'Brien's mighty fast, whether it's in sim racing or in real life, uh, but he does seem to be struggling here a little bit on pace because Angus Fender is right on the rear end, and I suspect that this move may happen sooner rather than later. I think uh, Brian's not even going to defend it into T1, so I don't think there's going to be too much of a dive as cuts back to the inside, and the Odox Motorsports come might make contact with Angus Fender. Oh, that was a little bit dodgy there from uh, the Odox Motorsport. That was a little bit too much but yeah whilst they're all battling this hard that lamborghini behind is absolutely going to close in especially considering mike noble's early race pace yeah that was uh, i was just climbing back from behind my desk again after that one very close bit of driving but this is really cool to see that we've got michael o'brien of british gt championship fame racing with angus fender of british gt championship fame so two very, very talented and established real world British T GT drivers racing each other in the GT World Challenge Esports Europe Endurance Series. So fabulous, fabulous to see. But as you rightly say, Mike Noble will be gunning it in 11th place to try and buy into this fight. And you can see 8th, 9th, and 10th position all very much within reach. We've still got over. 45 minutes of the race left to go so everything's still on the table for my noble but meanwhile david tanitza continues to serenely run at the lead of this race yeah i'm gonna say that patch gergs's pace is actually pretty decent i mean uh considering he just jumped in the car uh, it, it's comparable to where uh, josh rogers was running if he could find a little bit more that'd be great uh, it's more in comparison to himself to tanitza it's not that gergs isn't quick it's that Tanitza is absolutely flying on the previous lap was three tenths faster than uh, Pash Gergis. So uh, at the moment, the Ferrari just pulling away and edging away and building the gap bit by bit as we ride on board with both Angus Fender and Michael O'Brien. I get the feeling the BS competition car might swoop a position here on the Rocket Sim Sports car closed off to the inside. So it has to be the long way round at the Red Defilio and they are going to be fighting it hard. There's a touch of contact and Angus Fender is forced to skip the corner. I think no matter what, even on pace from exit, uh, that is going to go back the way of Michael O'Brien. Just wonder if O'Brien was washing out a little bit there on the Rocket Sim Sport car. Yeah, a little bit of trading paint between the two British GT Championship rivals, but uh, Angus Fender drops back again in the BMW, lives to fight another day, goes too wide with O'Brien, not enough room, decides to cut back, tries to get the run through the chicane, which he achieves very nicely indeed. Thank you very much. Down into the first Lesbo, he has the inside line, stay away from the curb. The yes, you do. Thank you very much. O'Brien decides not worth fighting that one too hard. A little bit of lap traffic between them, and then hey ho. Mike Noble starting to buy into this fight again. So we've got a great little battle going on. Meanwhile, Capoccia is four seconds to the good further up the road so he'll want these two to continue fighting but O'Brien's not giving up and he attacks again on Angus Fender. Fender makes the big BMW even bigger indeed in the run into Ascari. No room for O'Brien but O'Brien and Fender you Neither of them are quicker than the other. It's a game of yo-yo, high-speed yo-yo, with 43 minutes on the clock, and the Lamborghini's here. Yeah, last Mike Noble going to be trying to make a move. He said that he was higher up the order uh, earlier in the race and uh, already gets by the position. That was heavy on the brakes and maybe a little bit easy for Michael O'Brien, but Mike Noble uh, around the outside uh, and, and gets that one sorted. So he's up into the points-paying positions and now going to try and get past uh, the BS competition man of Angus Fender. No disrespect to Brioni, uh, Mike Noble's teammate, but he is doing a little bit of damage repair at the moment and seeing what he can get out of it moment that he passes the BS competition man, he does have 10 seconds to go and catch Capoccia. So a fair way down the order. So uh, those two as well battling out behind. They are battling for position. It's just much further down the order. It's, uh, I believe, for like 27th position. So a, a, a fair way. You, you just have to 
I'm concerned. If I'm one, if I'm the likes of Michael O'Brien, I am concerned about them behind me because, I mean, let's be honest, the Odox motorsport car nearly over the corner and nearly took Angus Fender out not too long ago. Yeah, it's a very, very sticky position to find yourself. It is a faster car with traffic that's still going at a good speed overall, but has been delayed during the course of the race. Do you let them go? and then risk being stuck behind them again. Do you defend, which we saw Michael O'Brien doing, into the Retifilio chicane, defending from lapped cars to stop them getting their way past? It's a really, really difficult situation to find yourself in. And O'Brien looks like he's not quite got the chops of the cars ahead of him, starting to fall back, even though Noble ran deep into T1 at the start of the lap. O'Brien falling ever so slightly back, as we see now, two back markers side by side the Audi just about makes it through the corner of the Williams eSport car of Jack Keithley this is a fight for 27th and 28th position Keithley on the charge again we go defensive down into the parabolic of Keithley sticking into the slipstream goes wide to the outside line he'll try and cut back to the inside to get the run off of the Parabolica, can't quite turn the Aston Martin as he would so desire and this one continues on the back straight to the rundown into the Retifilio. Yeah, you want a driver with experience, Jack Keefley, he's been at the front Ooh. end of sim racing for 10 years and that does not show that level of experience, contact on the back of the Odox Motorsport car and Jack Keithley might be having a word with race control after that, making contact with the rear of the Audi, that is not ideal, seems the Audi has got away with that for the most part and it is actually the Williams Esports car that's uh, footed most of the bill but yeah, in the consideration of, like, I was, I was just talking of Jack Keithley's sim racing experience in the sense that he has genuinely been in sim racing for over 10 years uh, from memory. He's been at the front for most of that, when it's, uh, uh, whether it's open wheelers, whether it's GTs, whether it's endurance, uh, whether it's sprint, whatever. You'll find Jack Keefley mostly at the front of grids. That is not how you should be driving, though. I don't, I, oh, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. But for Michael O'Brien, that is uh, put a pin in a problem that he had. He no longer needs to worry about those two cars. They've sorted themselves and taken themselves out of contention. So one less factor to worry about for O'Brien in his fight for the final points of the afternoon. Although 11th position now, 1.2 seconds in a rear from the hard charging Mike Noble. That is looking more and more difficult for the British GT man. Noble on the bike of Angus Fender in ninth place. So maybe something can come of that from him but yeah it's a difficult one when you've got lap traffic and that sort of thing can happen very easily indeed a little bit of contact you get involved in somebody else's accident and all your hard work straight away gets thrown up and chucked in the dustbin but luckily they only compromise themselves and nobody else in uh, what was another bizarre one wasn't it it was echoes of the nils now yacht contact earlier yeah, thankfully, the difference between that two is it seems like the only two cars that were involved in that on the start finish straight, obviously considerably wider than the mid stretch, <laughs> um, was the two drivers actually involved. Obviously, the one on the, the, the mid stretch between Nyox and uh, the Hap Racing car uh, involved quite a few others, including uh, Yaz Heat, who are back inside the points. And of course, um, the 157, I believe, was also involved in the latter point of that. And that's why they were a little bit further down. They pitted in a little bit earlier to buy Pfeffer in 14th at the moment as the battle for 20th. 27th uh, Whitman behind the wheel trying to attack um, I was going to say that is the Odox no works car but no it's not that's the that might actually be Pfeffer so this is a little bit further down and more defending from hits behind so here we see a replay of the incident earlier on that we saw coming down the back straight this is on board now look at the Audi ahead of us does he move position does he apply the brakes at any stage of the race no he doesn't we come into the parabolica we go wide we look to the inside we try and get a run onto the back straight there's nothing doing at this moment in time the number 55 is hard on the accelerator trying to find a way past keep it as close as he can to the rear of the car the Audi checks up actually Ooh, yeah. a little bit there so the Audi checks up on the straight nowhere to go when you're running that close to each other for Jack Keithley and away and around he goes so quite what was happening there I don't think that was slipstream Lewis that looked like the Audi just lost momentarily a little bit of forward momentum and wham bam thank you ma'am let's have ourselves some pirouetted wham bam thank you man. well that is that is impressive i'm not 100 percent sure if uh, looking back on it uh, uh, just trying to see if i can find a, a, another bit 
I, I'm just wondering if the brake lights came on on that car. No, it was just the angle that we were seeing. I don't know how they came together so aggressively from what looked like a fairly innocuous tap between the two. But either way, uh, just trying to use that very last moment of slipstream. And uh, uh, yeah, okay, for Keithley, I'll, I'll take that one back. That was a little bit more, like there's, there's a bit more to it quite clearly. Uh, but either way, I think race control have got straight on it and have delivered a drive-through penalty to the 55. Yep, so Keith Lay suffering from a drive-through penalty Ooh. for that incident. But as we say, it was quite a... Well, there's more to it than on first glance, but race controller made their decision. So Jack Keithley and Williams Esports Day continues to go very wrong indeed. Just going to actually correct that a little bit, because I believe we're, we've, we've not... We're, we're waiting to see what's happened from race control. As far as the word is that that drive-through penalty has not come from race control. Uh, they are still looking at that incident, which means that there's only one thing that it could come from, and that is track limits. So, which we have seen a few drivers exploiting. Let's go with that, shall we? We'll use that word. Uh, they, they've been pushing it to the very limit, and yeah, the, the game's starting to, to get on top of some of the drivers that are pushing it that little bit further than others. And it's so easy, Lewis, isn't it, to yeah. do at a track like Monza. Such a high-speed circuit, you need to use the kerbs, you need to use the full width of the racetrack. And often, just the track position of your car pushes you into a what's deemed as a cutting scenario. But it's not by choice, it's just the momentum of the car taking you away from the racing line. So, three hours, a lot of opportunities for that mistake to happen. Yeah, 100%. I mean, especially around here, uh, it's a circuit which uh, I've spoken before about some circuits which kind of self penalize. So if you go to places like Snetterton, if you're going to cut the corner there, right, you're probably going off at high speed um, because it's, it's, it's a circuit that for the most part, like, does the track limits itself in a way around here. Uh, courtesy of all of the things that race around here. I mean, when you consider circuits that are multi-purpose, I mean, this is used for trucks, it's used for bikes, it's used for GTs, open wheelers, touring cars, what have you. Literally everything races around here. So it has to sort of balance out for everyone in that scenario. And so it does mean that there's a lot of runoff in some places and etc. And it's just easy to take advantage uh, of that and, and just push it a little bit too far. Wait till you go to Paul Ricard. Uh, next round, where we're going to see potentially even more. Yeah, Paul Ricard is going to be a great challenge. Remember, everybody at home, 5th of June, the six hours of Paul Ricard, live and exclusive here on the GT World YouTube channel. So make sure you don't miss out that race, the second round of the Endurance Series here in the GT World Challenge Esports Europe Championship. But back to today, Angus Fender is clinging on to that ninth position for dear life at the moment. Mike Noble with ample speed in the Lamborghini, closing up to the rear of the BMW man. Mike Noble trying to recover from some early difficulties for teammate Barone, up and outside of the points. They're now back in those points paying positions he wants another one he wants the two points for ninth position looks one way then the other now on the outside angus fendler on the defensive we've seen fender in action before he knows how to defend he knows how to absorb pressure but mike noble i fear has got just too much raw speed in that lamborghini at this stage in the race did see that it was pokey on lap one got uh, moves done down into Ascari on the very first lap and it seems like it is going to go the way of the Lamborghini uh, again on this occasion getting by Angus Fender and up into ninth position the contrast of cameras Angus Fender's got a race suit in the background Mike Noble has got a certain emoji cushion in the background as well good on him uh, I said all drivers taking advantage of using the cameras and getting stuff onto the broadcast so power to them do love seeing into the eyes and the emotions of various drivers but that was a pretty nice move for the mcw racing team and up to ninth position so getting some of those points back i think capoccia might be a little bit too far down the road but either way i'd settle for some for, for a good couple of points from the first round Yes, it's a nice recovery from Noble and team and Angus Fender didn't really put too much of a fight up against the Lamborghini. I'm sure Fender will also be very satisfied to come home in the points. Knows there's not really much point trying to fight for the next 33 minutes against a car that is clearly faster than you are. So Fender doing the sensible job, letting the car pass, minimising the time loss for himself in his own race and just consolidating against the chasing O'Brien as we're looking a little bit further down the running order. This is 
13th, the battle for 13th position, some great shots coming through the chicane, we're riding with the number 97 Ferrari, that's Curza in the side, Max Motorworks Ferrari, using all the circuit, a little bit of the grass and more in his battle with Grabowski ahead, 12th and 13th position, and Pfeiffer in 14th, not too far in arrears, trying to close up on this nice little fight just outside of the points. Yeah, used to seeing uh, Grabowski and Ogre uh, in the number 41 Aston Martin, though normally it's the black and yellow uh, of the Lada Sport Rosenef team. Yep. This time uh, it goes the way of the Simware.pro uh, squad. So it's just fre a fresh branding to a team that will know each other very, very well. But they have to be careful because battling it out hard, Lucas Kreutzer needs to get by Grabowski pretty fast because Tobias Pfeffer in that 157 uh, R8G car is closing in at a swift rate of knots and the young German will be desperate to move up positions after some early drama. They were on the tail end of that incident between uh, Nyox and the uh, Hap Racing car, so between G2 Esports uh, and Hap Racing. Let's see if Lucas Kreutzer can make a move in the Ferrari this time by. Yeah, Kreutzer around the outside, coming down into the Retifilio. Looks a little bit better on the brakes, going side by side. Even Stevens at the moment in time. That becomes the inside for the second part of the chicane. Be careful not to push your rival off the racetrack, which you do not give each other racing room. So a nice bit of clean, hard and fair racing. And 12th position for Kreutzer is the end result. Grabowski drops down in a 13th place and meanwhile at the head of the field David Tenitzer is flying at the moment currently pulling away from second place man at a 48.2 average lap time of 1 minute 48.2 at this stage in proceedings so with 31 minutes left on the clock David Tenitzer is flying in the FDA Ferrari yeah, again, just to hammer home the point that I said earlier in the race, that it's not necessarily that Pash Gerges is going slow, it's that Tunitsia yeah. is going so very fast. Gerges, in comparison to the rest of the top 10, uh, setting times that are comparable. Uh, it's a mid-48, which pretty much the entirety of the top 10 were running. In fact, over the previous lap, his 48.483 was actually faster than everyone else inside the top 10. It just so happens to be that Tunitsia pulls out a further three tenths by setting a 48.276 over this run and only a a few laps ago, he set a 48-1, did Tunitza, so throwing a lot of numbers out at you, but just to simplify it for you, he's going very quick, and that 48-1 was his personal best lap of the race uh, earlier in this stint, so that Ferrari is flying, and so for the second evening in a row, Coan de Simsports being upstaged by the Ferrari Driver Academy esports team. But isn't this an exciting prospect for the rest of the yeah. season? A little bit of a rivalry started, I feel, and I cannot wait to see how that transpires over the course of the year. Meanwhile, Grabowski, Dennis Grabowski, on the fight back a little bit, having lost position on the previous lap. Oh, nearly collects an Aston Martin behind, collects the Ferrari in front instead, gets a little bit phased about the car, getting close to him from the back. And unfortunately, the man that we're looking at now, because it's Kurza, is the one suffers the biggest penalty the number 97 ferrari facing the wrong direction he recovers the car again scratches his head what happened there and sadly that takes him out of that fight and dennis Kruboski gets a drive-through penalty probably for track limits because it was so quick for good measure as well actually wasn't that was a drive-through penalty for a different incident appearing oh, on gosh. screen now so the oh. 130 so i'm just going to note the one at the bottom at the moment the 130 versus the car 41 so 41 uh, was the is the car that's currently being driven by grabowski uh, the 130 is the Ratten racing by clash uh, Lamborghini, uh, which is the one that's directly ahead of Kreutzer now. So receives a drive-through penalty for that on the very second he hit <laughs> the Ferrari of Lucas Kreutzer, which I would suggest is potentially another drive-through penalty heading his way, so not ideal. The other one uh, is for the 55. That one is Jack Keithley in the Williams eSports squad, so a drive-through to them as well. So their day's going from bad to worse. But again, if your car's not going to be very good, let's just get all the issues out of the way in the opening round and get that sorted with and then move on to the next one. That's the one, exactly. Use up your allocation of bad luck on the event that respectfully doesn't count for how competitive your car is and then live to fight and come back another day but Grabowski a very fast driver very talented driver of course shame to see him in so much strife so much 
in this race. He goes down pit road, serves his pit lane drive through penalty. Jack Heathley, Williams Esports, that we're looking at now, another driver that needs to go make a quick visit to pit lane, probably at the end of this lap. There's 27 minutes, 53 seconds left to go on the clock. Both drivers now well out of the fight for points contention, but that moves. That little incident and the drive through for Grabowski moves Pfeiffer up to 12th position. Dominic Blyer into 13th position as well. So a Lamborghini, one Lamborghini out of contention, another one very much still in the fight is Dominic Blyer in 13th position, the number 10, two seconds away from Pfeiffer ahead. Yeah, DV1 try at an incredible speed, but they've had issues today, certainly, uh, including making contact with uh, Pfeffer's car not too long ago, obviously towards the, uh, I think it was in, in the early stages of the second hour. Uh, and yeah, so so not, not been the greatest day for them, but still, one thing I will say, and this is a, a point on Jack Keith, and this is a point to everyone in sim racing, it's uh, one thing that I do really, really like with Jack Keith, it's the support from his father who is very much like behind his sim racing career and very much pushing him of course with the younger sim racers that is a fairly sort of common thing that your parents are pushing you a little bit to do better and it's kind of weird that if you think of it like five years ago you, your parents would be pushing you to do karting or whatever and pushing <laughs> it to the very limits here but now they're very much it's not just a game it's not this it's put it, it is a Yes, it's a sim, sure, whatever, but it's a real race. It absolutely is. Every single second counts, and your parents and stuff pushing you. Really like to see it. Would like to see more of that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, just, just why not? Get get your family involved and get everyone involved with sim racing. And, you know, it kind of brings that familial vibe. And I think that is absolutely wonderful to see. It's a really nice point. I'm from a different generation where my dad looks at it and goes, hey, what's this? does not understand it whatsoever. Different generations, different things. As you say, we've gone from karting, we've gone from the physical world to the virtual world. It's turned into more than just a hobby and a passion for a lot of people. It's turning into a professional career where you can earn good money for essentially living out your dream. And that's another reason why championships like this series and of course all of the SRO eSport championships are a fabulous shop window for drivers who maybe don't have the funds or the circumstances to get involved in motor racing can show off their skills to the to the world to the fans to the public to the potential sponsors and potential teams and get themselves a career in virtual motorsport and it's a fabulous initiative and it's wonderful to see after many years I think it's fair to say Lewis both you and I have been in sim racing for a long long time now after many years of being undervalued by the real world it's wonderful to see now I think real world motorsport getting involved and getting interested in what we've got going on here yeah there's a lot of initiatives in sim racing to push it forward of course what we have here uh, on a set of course of competizioni with the GT World Challenge Esports uh, outing so from Asia America and of course the two Europeans being sprint and endurance championships so there's plenty going on obviously we have British GTs there's loads over here of course you've got the push from things like VCO Esports etc that are moving sim racing forward with Sim racing has very, very quickly turned from being games and drivers, say like, like you know, what we've all been used to for God knows how long, to now being taken very, very seriously. And racecraft and culture and stuff and sponsorships and stuff, it is real deal stuff in sim racing, moving from strength to strength. And it's something which will only get more and more prevalent with time. It's something which is like we've effectively hit the start button on all of it. And it is going to continue to grow bit by bit, especially with the help and support of, uh, you know, uh, manufacturers, the help and support of uh, real world alliances out there that are pushing sim racing forward so it is really a bright time to be in sim racing and so to me if you want to be at the front of sim racing now's the time because imagine being at the front of sim racing when it's growing this far the likes of josh rogers of tanitza of course on this grid the likes of erhan Yovsky, of everyone else like that being that important and that intertwined with sim racing what a time but the upshot of that is the level of driver ability has gone through the roof just like real world motorsport like formula one back in the 50s and 60s was very much an amateur affair you had more serious outfits than others more serious drivers than others that was sim racing in the last 10 years but now it has gone ultra professional now you've got real world teams big money involved new talents are becoming exposed to the sport and picking it up and picking it up incredibly quickly as you've mentioned we've got 15 year olds performing wonders out on the circuit today and everybody's up their game and it's never been 
seen as competitive as it is at this moment in time. You just need to look at this grid. You need to look at the grid from yesterday's sprint race. An amazing collection of very, very talented and fast eSport drivers, one of which is this one. Now, Charlie Collins in fourth position for the VRS Coanda Porsche team. They had third for two hours and change. Unfortunately, in the pit stop cycle, they've wound up on fourth position. Chris Herker takes over that bottom step of the podium, but Charlie Collins is giving absolutely everything to try and reduce that two second deficit and get himself back in contention for third place. It's only changing a tenth here, a bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there. It's tiny, tiny margins, which the thing is with sim racing these days is that's what is required. It's You don't tend to see too much of gaining a second, second and a half a lap. It is in the tenths and in the thousandths. It yeah. is a game of perfection uh, these days, and it is hard work. And that is why, I don't know if it's the same with you, that's why I'm in the commentary booth, because I can't look more. <laughs> no, I'm good, thanks. Uh, much easier, great view from up here. Grabowski into the pit lane, drives through penalty. Uh, that is the one, as far as I'm aware, that'll be the one against the 130 uh, car, so the Lamborghini. Uh, just serving it, whether he's got another one coming, we'll have to wait and see, as we're focused on GTWR. And now on Jota, who's gonna try and make a position on Hillebrand. And we've seen these two be pretty close earlier in the race, and continuing to do so. Now yeah, indeed, it's a rubbish table for the youngster that we spoke about earlier on. Only 15 years of age, I believe, uh, Lewis said. A rubbish table for now, very much on the march forward. Hillebrand ahead of him, trying to find a way past the Honda NSX. Has Stapleford got what is required in the final 21 minutes of this race to find that 24th position and to chase the rest of the cars ahead of him will stay on board now with the Joda McLaren 720s we run down into the red affilio chicane we've got to be careful not to collect the back of the NSX ahead under braking job done catch the apex one catch apex two get a nice clean run try and be smooth on the accelerator smooth on the steering minimal lock possible as we go through the curve of grande keeping behind that NSX try to keep the slipstream allowing it to pull the car up ever closer to the back of the Honda ahead we're not close enough to make a move into the second she came but we'll watch our braking try and catch the apex nice and smooth maximum acceleration through the second part of the chicane a little bit of opposite lock on corner exit but nothing to worry about for stable third going down now into the first lesbo nice and tight keeping the car nice and smooth looks very stable very neutral not pushing wide not losing the back end too much into the second lesbo again nice and tight maximize the race strike on the exit we're a little bit closer to the mclaren now for the run down into the Ascari chicane very difficult to find anywhere to pass into Ascari don't want to get too close if we're not going to go alongside so he doesn't hold us up mid corner of the car ahead Hillebrand goes defensive really close on the back of the car a little bit deep into the first part of this car it's the car as she came that compromises on corner exit Hillebrand kicks up a little bit of dirt once again a Robbie Stapleford doing everything he can but the car just not quite got that final tenth of a second but Hillebrand looks a little bit scruffy at this moment in time so Stapleford will be encouraged by what he sees yeah trust me there are people on the grid that are hard to pass Nico Hillebrand will definitely be one of them he's got a whole host of experience in sim racing I've battled with Hillebrand on my uh, fair few occasions in sim racing more so in open wheelers than in uh, GTs but uh, he's certainly a driver that has found very much a home here on a set of course of competition and he's actually in the early stages when the when it was growing as a simulator, was a driver who would really found his pace uh, on this platform. As Staplewood's going to go around the outside a little bit, muscle between the two of them, but that's as good as you like. And the young man, 15 years of age, gets that one done on Hillebrand. That is brilliant stuff from nice. Robbie Stapleford. Absolutely spot on. Speaking of his teammate, though, currently on the grid, Rocket Simsport, Michael O'Brien closing in on Angus Fender on that important final point. That was lovely from Stapleford. We watched him for the preceding lap. We saw how he was weighing up where the opportunity exists. Wasn't going for anything foolish, keeping it nice and calm. And then when the opportunity presented itself, an opportunity set up two, three, four quarters before to get the good run on the back straight and through T1. He took it with a plum. Robbie Stapleford belaying his 15 years with a very mature performance indeed. Great overtaking manoeuvre. And unfortunately, it's outside of the points at this stage in proceedings. But no doubt, that is a name that we will see popping up from time to time over the course of the next few weeks. And someone 
very much to keep an eye out for. But Michael O'Brien now in 11th position. As you say, teammate to the young Robbie Stapleford. 11th place, real world GT driver, established sim racer as well. O'Brien can see Angus Fender ahead and slowly, slowly, he's catching up to the back of the BMW. Yeah, we're seeing uh, a battle here a little bit further down the order. I'm not actually sure that was a, a battle. Just jumping back either way to the Honda of Maloney um, for, for Team BUSR, uh, who've not had a particularly good day. They were up the order uh, from memory um, uh, a little bit early. I will say it is good to see um, Bridport, who's the other driver in this car, driving a livery where he's actually taken it a bit seriously. Uh -huh. um, I once commented on not too long ago, driving a white McLaren with... Uh, graphic design is my passion in multiple colours uh, written in Comic Sans across the car and a team name Help. Uh, so Bridport, this, this one's taken it a bit more seriously. Big approve of that livery. We do actually quite like it. Uh, but unfortunately not towards the top end of the broadcast today. Down in 31st position and a few laps down to beat. The, 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 the shame really in this scenario down here for me is that number four car, Lucas Muller, who's currently running in 30th spot, obviously a few laps down as well, was right up there towards the points paying position. I know Danny Juice, team manager, will be in chat not happy about what happened between them and G2 Esports, but yeah, you have those races where these things just happen. You've got to take them on the chin and roll off. You do indeed, but I doff my hat to Lucas Muller and the Hat Racing team for continuing, even though they're well out of contention following that contact. It would have been very, very easy to have walked away from the race, rage quit from the event, knowing that you're not going to get anything out of it. But uh, as I say, tip my cap to the team for persevering and keeping running, even though they're well out of contention and just slowly plugging away, seeing what they can pick up, seeing what they can learn, seeing what they can understand about their rivals, about the championship, about the car as well. So credit where credit's due there to the Hat Racing team, continuing, although very, very much, down the running order in 30th place. I think uh, the race for the lead is, I would say, done. 16 minutes to go, lap traffic can play its part, but with only 16 minutes to go to is very much in control here uh, on home soil uh, at Monza still pulling away bit by bit the 10th here a 10th there uh, Pash Gerges's pace has dropped off a little bit and it is rising up into the upper end of the 1 minute 48 but I will say that behind again just I know it's only a 10th here and a 10th there and a bit here and a bit there but that gap between Hooker and Collins is in fact coming down. The 88 is closing it. And once it gets within a sort of bubble and starts receiving the slipstream on a consistent basis from the 22, you'd suspect that gap will drop off a fair amount more. Now, you're going to be aggressive. Final few laps of the race. If you're within that window, you're going to send it. Surely, surely there is something coming in that podium spot if Collins can keep this pace up. Yeah, absolutely. Collins has been winding himself up to get on contention with Chris Herker in third place. But just going back to uh, David Tenninser for a moment, as you say, the race at the front of the field looks like it's pretty much come to an end. It'll be interesting to see what kind of tyre life that Tenninser is achieving in that Ferrari. He's used his monumental pace from the beginning of his second stint in the car almost an hour ago. Is there enough left? in that Ferrari to comfortably take him to the flag. And more of the point, will Gerges have better tyres underneath him and start to bring that gap down and put Tinnitsa under pressure? These are questions that we will answer in 14 minutes and 33 seconds when the chequered flag has already waved. But Michael O'Brien now, there's a few seconds in arrears, but he's all over the rear of Angus Fender. So O'Brien, of the two British GT regulars, has the more pace at this stage in the race. And Michael O'Brien now, over his rival and friend, Angus Fender, will be very keen indeed to take that point away from the BMW man. So this is going to be tight now in the last 15 minutes or so. Yeah, it's a bit of a surprise. I'm not, I, I don't know if it was just trying to get in the car and not really gelling with it in the early stages, but I thought Michael O'Brien's pace in the early stages of this stint was, was pretty not great. And I, I thought that it was a certainty that they weren't going to be scoring points this afternoon. Uh, clearly got to grips with the vehicle and is closing back up to the BMW. And this is a fight which I think even if O'Brien gets through, Angus Fender's going to sit there and this will go down to the wire if they stay close, if they stay clean. I mean, this, this 23 car that are on board with has been battling out with um, Saclari in that 191 Bentley for most of the race. So they're used to battling. They understand battling with another car. 
uh, but not a BMW. I, I, I think this might be a tense fight. Yeah, this is going to be good. It's one to definitely keep an eye on. In the final 30 minutes of the race, both drivers very accomplished. Know how to soak up the pressure. Know how to dish out the hard knocks as well to each other as everybody does that's had any involvement with British GT Championship. Knows how to race and get the elbows out. So I'm looking forward to seeing who is the eventual, uh, not winner, but the winner of this little fight in the course of the rest of the race. But at the moment, I would say O'Brien definitely seems to have a little bit more lap time in that McLaren from memory I think he was three or four seconds uh, in arrears to the BMW at one point during the stint so he's definitely closed the gap down not a lot of traffic to coming into play at this moment in time but tyre wear traffic pressure all these things 12 minutes in which for him to wash out anything could happen between these two yeah, I, I think this is going to be a, a very, very interesting fight indeed. Not sure which way it's going to swing. By the way, I've received a bit of a note um, that the uh, team... I was saying about Cameron Bridport and the BUSR car, uh, which, by the way, stands for the British University Sim Racing um, team. So there we go. There's, there's that one. So I did wonder what it meant. Um, but there is uh, graphic design is my passion on that car somewhere. So yeah. I will be taking a very close look at that vehicle later on. Fantastic stuff. Good to see the little running joke continue. Although, like you say, the car does look very nice yeah. indeed. Dressed up in that BUSR livery as Michael O'Brien again closes to the back of the BMW. 11 minutes and 40 seconds left on the clock. Good time to remind you all at home. Well, first and foremost, to thank you all at home. If you've watched us from the beginning or you're just joining in now, hello, welcome, thank you for spending some time with us on this Sunday afternoon, Saturday afternoon even here at the Monza Grand Prix circuit. We're back again, 5th of June, for the six hours of Paul Ricard, so don't miss out on that one. That will be a blast as uh, we try and work out which corner's which, because they all look the same at Paul Ricard. Uh, so do join us <laughs> for that one. But uh, Michael O'Brien continues to fight hard for this 10th position. Angus Fender holds that 10th position. Mike Noble now, quite a while the road in ninth Capoccia in p8 Sicolare in the bentley the highest of the finish, running bentleys at the moment in seventh position Gronwald in p6 santoro holding on a fifth in the number 27 ferrari collins and herker fighting hard for third position another little battle starting to rumble gerkis in second place now seven nearly eight seconds away from our runaway race leader david Tinitzer for the ferrari driver academy esport team currently leading with ten and a half minutes left on the clock of this three-hour race I would say, you know, normally in the early stages of the race, you kind of, you await the right opportunity and patience as to when to, to make that move and make the gap. Well, I mean, neither of these two are going to be afforded that opportunity. There's just 10 minutes to go in the race, so it's around about six laps from when they cross the line now uh, before they, they greet the chequered flag. So there is not many more opportunities for something to happen. 62 gets a drive-through penalty. That's Niels Nyox. So uh, uh, that is from the game. So that will be for track limits. So a day which started out well is going from bad to worse. Lone BMW up in the points now is the one that's currently on the screen and it may well not be in the points by the time we get to the end of the race. Just want to say a very quick thing on that 191 car that Saclari is currently behind the wheel of. I've got to give them a shout out. The Bentley I did not think was going to be good at all in this race. Did say that it might do a little bit better on the fuel mileage, but either way, what a superb drive thus far to be in a Bentley up that high in the order, battling it out as hard as they are. And like genuinely, that is a top effort. Yeah, it really is a fabulous performance and from both drivers in the car. The car's not particularly competitive, the Bentley here at Monza, but seventh position. He's been in the, in the heat of battle throughout the course of the race with many different drivers, never folded under pressure, not done anything ridiculous. And seventh place in a nice haul points are uh, to go with it as Michael O'Brien now Angus Fender ahead trying very very desperately to uh, break the toe of O'Brien behind but O'Brien not really uh, reacting to that one just continuing on the forward motion chasing 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 and doing an absolutely fantabulous job uh, both drivers real world of course for the British GT and talking about real world drivers don't forget that on Saturday the 29th the Fanatec Pro Series in Paul Ricard will be taking place which is the real world GT World Challenge drivers racing in a vi uh, virtual environment 
four points towards the real world championships. So it's around 2 p.m. CEST, give or take, on the GT World Challenge uh, YouTube channel. So check it out. That's going to be fantastic to see real and virtual worlds colliding together in what will be, no doubt, a spectacular esports spectacular. Yeah, I remember back in the day, uh, we used to. Uh, there was always a thing where you'd be on a grid with a real world driver and you'd groan, you think, oh. And it's yeah. not because you think they're going to outpace you, it's because you know they're going to take you out at some point. Um, these days, absolutely not the case. All the real world drivers, that they've started, you know, once one or two starts taking it seriously in some degree, then the rest of them do. And so watching real world racers take to each other on the sim is always an exciting experience uh, in 2021 and the years beyond, I'm sure. So, uh, I, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be a thriller. Always, always kind of is when we uh, when we get to racing, uh, GT racing here on a set of course of competition. You, know, you always see some fantastic stuff, whether it's, you know, sometimes it's for the lead, sometimes it isn't. Today at the moment, it isn't. It's more for the battles down the grid. But we have seen some stunning moves, which I do get the feeling that if Michael O'Brien is going to get by Angus Fender, it does need to be an absolute blinder. Yeah, it really does. Angus Fender knows how to defend, knows how to race. He's got a fair turn off pace in the BMW as well. He's not exactly that Michael O'Brien's one, two, three, four seconds per lap faster than the BMW driver, but he's got enough to put himself in contention. But can Michael O'Brien find a way past Angus Fender for the final points paying position of the opening race at the GT World Challenge Esports Europe endurance season? O'Brien closed very quickly onto the back of the BMW. But as Murray Walker once said, catching is one thing, passing is entirely a different thing. And at the moment, Angus Fender is placing that BMW exactly where he needs to do to prevent any easy opportunities for Michael O'Brien. Both drivers will be conscious. They don't want to get involved in an accident after three hours, two hours and 55 minutes worth of racing to throw it away at the very, very end as Angus Fender, look at him now, concentrated, riding Ooh. on board with the BMW. He's got a nasty, nasty run out of the first chicane. This is O'Brien's opportunity, shows it down the inside. O'Brien gets this to defender, defends very, very late, actually closes that door, but both of my contact. And Lewis, this has got an overtaking opportunity, chance at the very least, written all over it. Oh, there's going to be contact, though. Ooh. There's just a touch as covering it off with Angus Fender, he's going to go across the Della Roger chicane. I think, I'm going to say, I think that's probably all fair because he was, uh, there, there was contact between the two. I don't think race control will get involved and tell them to switch positions based on where the contact was in the braking zone. Michael O'Brien could have switched over to the inside uh, and sent something, but that fight very much on. That was definitely O'Brien's best, uh, best opportunity to try and make something stick off of the, the first chicane, but just not able to do anything it was going to be covered off uh either way i get the feeling from angus fender but showing that there is the potential for a move i think that's only round one possibly a round two still to come before this race wraps up now we're looking at marcy and Rich in 16th position so this is the number 720 mclaren 720s of carbon sim sport marcy and Rich, 16th place not really close enough to anybody ahead to try and move himself up the running order, but very much under pressure from Fifet and David Patil as well in 17th and 18th. So Patil in the Lamborghini for Clash Sim Sport, I believe that is the number 129. Let's have a quick look. Uh, Rotten Racing by Clash doing everything he can to try and buy into this fight, as well as Angus Fender once again on the defensive. Michael O'Brien round the outside into the chicane, not got enough on the braking, brings it back to the back of the BMW, tries to get a run off the corner, but not quite got enough. And this fight continues with four minutes left on the clock. O'Brien on a charge. Yeah, time ticking away. This is the best opportunity for O'Brien to get through. There was contact here a lap ago. Is there going to be contact once again? Seems like the 720 is firing on all cylinders at the moment, but no way through on the BMW. Just a little bit of a note on Tanitza, who was stuck behind that battle that we just saw between uh, Federic and uh, Piffitt at the moment. By the way, that 66 is a Team Fordzilla car, uh, obviously in a Lexus, which is always fun to say, a Fordzilla with a different brand, uh, the Ford back squad. Um, the pace, by the way, from Tanitza, the average pace over the first hour of the race in that first thing that Tanitza did was a 48.4. Showing how much he's built up with the race, his pace average over this stint is a 48.2. So, I mean, like as an average to increase by two tenths uh, over, over an hour long period, that is 
absolutely insane, including at this point in the race, you get more lap traffic, you have more to play with, shows how impressive he's been. Yeah, David Tanitza in a rich favour form at this moment in time. Of course, he won the sprint race yesterday evening, so uh, already got a victory in the bag. And then again, same track, the endurance race, currently on track alongside his teammate Giovanni Di Salvo on track to take another win and that will be a unique position i think in the world of sro esports that is championship leader on two championships that are both running at the same time so david tanitza rich rich vein of form at the moment he's only got another two minutes and 42 seconds to navigate around this beautiful monza grand prix circuit and then he can take home be a richly deserved race victory for the Ferrari Driver Academy esports team. Yeah, into the slipstream. You can see he's about to start the penultimate lap of the race. It's the Carbon uh, Simsport 720, 720. This is 720 and 720. Uh, just ahead. So going a lap down after really not a good run through this race. But for Tanitza, just going to have another couple of laps. Saw how casual he was when we had the onboard a few laps ago. Well, we're seeing into uh, where he's driving at the moment. Um, how casual he was, very much, uh, you know, just, just holding the wheel and just like cr cruising, basically, almost driving uh, on, on 10s and 2s. But um, I think there is another thing that we can point out in this scenario is that if you watch the, uh, the onboard screen there, you can just see on the right hand side, every driver will be running with like a slightly custom camera angle in a sense. And you can see that Tanitsis is very far forward and quite high up looking down, uh, almost, not quite, but almost close to the sort of like sense of in the vein of a, almost a roof camera, uh, but but not quite that far. By the way, uh, certain personal best and closing in on sixth position, Saclari flying moment in that Bentley. Oh, Kevin Saclari doing a fabulous job in the 191. As you say, the fastest by quite some margin, the highest running of the Bentley drivers as the little fight. Angus Fender, Sting's been taken out of the tail somewhat in this fight from the incident we saw just a lap ago. O'Brien having to make a little bit more track time. Fender wisely keeping that advantage that he was forced into taking from the incident into the chicane. So Fender buying himself a little bit of free room, but Kevin Saclare, what a job once again. We'll see this again in the number 191 Racing Line Motorsports Bentley Continental GT3 has been absolutely fabulous and great value for money throughout the course of the race. Just a shame that Bentley doesn't qualify quite well enough because its race pace yeah. seems more than uh, more than capable. Final lap of the race then from David Tinitza at the front of the field. And we see on the left-hand side, it's a Rocket versus a Zebra, and it is pretty tight. They'll still have another lap after this, of course, based on their, their distance. They're going to come round. They are going to start their final lap uh, the next time by, which does mean that Michael O'Brien has a fair few opportunities to try and make something stick, as does Saclari, who has closed in once again on the Unicorns of Love of Gronewald and I get the feeling that there might be a switch there because that Bentley is on good money pace has actually from him been up there with the top three on consistency all day absolutely super performances throughout the field as the fight rages for 10th position once again O'Brien now jumps out of the slipstream tries to put pressure on to Angus Fender Fender is equal and more to that pressure keeps racetrack position doesn't do anything crazy doesn't snatch any brakes doesn't miss any apex as an angus fender is in the pound seats to retain this 10th place michael o'brien knows he's got to throw he's got to roll the dice and hope for the very best but as everybody knows when you gamble it's often a risky business and does o'brien have anything left in the tank to try and free that one Final point away from his British GT Championship rival, Angus Fender ahead. One lap to find out that answer for these guys Ooh. as we head down into Retifilio. I was about to say, if they have anything issue-wise, Pfeffer might take advantage, but Pfeffer is into the pit lane and Tanitza is into the Parabolica for the last time. David Tanitza, winner of the sprint race event yesterday evening for the Ferrari Driver Academy eSport team dominates here at Monza to win the GT World Challenge eSports Europe endurance season opening race of the season. 25 points, all the accolades and the trophy. David Tanitza, a superb performance in the VRS Coanda eSport team comes Pascurgis in second position and a race-long battle, Chris Hawker in 
third place rounds out the podium from what has been an incredible, fantastic, superb, intense, dramatic and excited opening endurance race of the day. Of the yeah. Season. Yeah, brilliant. Truly, truly brilliant stuff. But uh, the race is not done yet because we've still got this battle for the final points paying position to sort out. And the opportunities are disappearing bit by bit for Michael O'Brien. I get the vibe, especially with the straight line speed of the BS competition car, that this may well be done early pace, just not in the hands of Michael O'Brien. I think Angus Fender might have, the, might have enough to do it, but he's got to do it properly because I think O'Brien's going to be close enough. It all comes down to the final corner now, but Angus Fender, very calm on the corner turning, very calm on the brakes and the accelerator as well, playing the game by the numbers, doing exactly what he needs to do, nothing yeah. dramatic, and a point is his reward. Easy stuff there in the centre, a lot of pressure, so I wouldn't say it's that easy, but uh, dealt with Michael O'Brien behind very, very well. Uh, tight battle at the top, though, it must be said, fantastic stuff between two heavyweights, and you were saying there about rivalries forming, the Ferrari Driver Academy Esports team against VRS Coanda, some big names in sim racing terms, and some of the biggest you'd ever want to see battling on a racetrack, and boy, oh boy, were we treated with a fantastic battle between the two. I get the vibe, though, that that battle not done yet. We've still got four rounds over the season. That is going to continue. Yes, yeah, exactly what we wanted to see from a championship like this. It's all about how hard the drivers can push. It's all about the teams. It's about the dynamics. It's all about the competition and the spirit of competition. As you say, I think we've got ourselves a bit of a rival reforming. We're back again on the 5th of June for the six hours of Paul Ricard, where the winners will have a chance to consolidate and the people on a less enjoyable race weekend today will have a tight chance to try and catch back up in the point standings. But at the end of the day, I think our man David Tanitza took the race victory in fantastic style. It was a dominant performance in the end when it was looking very dicey at one point for the Ferrari driver, wasn't it? It was just like, again, this is what I, I hammered at uh, uh, earlier points in the broadcast. It's not just the pace, it's the consistency yeah. that these days in sim racing, perfection's the only thing that is that, that, that is currency. You know, your, your mistakes really do cost you these days in sim racing. And yeah, I, I just, my, my, my hat is taken off to them for that level of consistency for three hours, absolute perfection at all moments. They didn't even start from pole, started from third just work their way up in the best possible way. Yep, and so, just to be clear for everybody watching at home, again, thank you for joining us. 25 points are awarded to the race winner, 18 points for second place, 15th goes to third place finisher, and then it's 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, and 1, down into 10th place. So, that's a healthy handful of points, but since it's on 25 points, great start to the season. The man is down, David to Nitsa. Congratulations, sir. Two days, two race victories. How does that feel? Well, it feels really great after the, the race win uh, yesterday. And this one was really, really tough, I'd say. And at the start of the race, um, we were struggling a little bit behind the Porsche. Uh, so we decided to save a little bit of fuel and then try the overtake later on. Uh, we managed to do it, but unfortunately we've been told to give the position back, so um, we had to overtake the Porsche again. And, and then amazing performance from my teammate Giovanni. And uh, yeah, then we overtook the, the first guy and we managed the final stint of the race until the, the checkered flag. Absolutely fantastic performance, and Giovanni, brilliant second stint in the car for yourself. So showed some incredible pace in that Ferrari, Giovanni. And uh, how does that feel to take the first win of the endurance season? Season. Uh, it was really intense. This race was phenomenal. Uh, we uh, we were not sure if. Uh, uh, if do one stint uh, and then two consecutive stint, but uh, we we decide to uh, to have uh, a bit of rest uh, for Davi in the, in the second stint and then have uh, a third stint uh, uh, in which uh, he could uh, push to the limit and be a little bit uh, more rested. Um, personally, my second stint was uh, a waiting one. We had uh, 
we were struggling a bit with the fuel consumption, so uh, we decided to um, to manage the fuel and to to be really late for the the last synth in order to have uh, to to push to the limit for for the last one. Well, the strategy worked out perfectly to take the race victory against some really strong competition. And for the both of you, have you got to have a little word about how strong this field is and how much talent that we've got in the endurance season this year across the field? Well, the level of the competition is insanely high. And, for example, to uh, recover, I think it was five seconds, uh, we were struggling a lot and basically uh, we didn't have to make any mistake, zero mistakes, because every single millisecond could cost us the win, so the skill level of this championship for me is insanely high. Yep, fantastic, fantastic stuff. And Lewis was saying on the broadcast work with uh, these two drivers, this team, and the fight with Coanda as well looks like it's going to be a storyline throughout the season, isn't it? It certainly yeah. is. Uh, just wanted to ask, your pace seemed to get better and better as the the race went on. Was that conditions or was that getting more to grips with the car? Um, well, yeah, at the start of the stint with more fuel, uh, we were struggling a little bit more. Uh, but then after the first like 15 minutes, uh, the tires went off pressure and we had less weight of fuel, so we were we could p push a little bit more. And especially on the last part of the stint, the car was really really fast compared to the to the um, to the Porsche guys, uh, which I think they were struggling a lot during the, the end of the stint with the tire wear. Now, a question for you, uh, Giovanni, if I can. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> both of you are racing in the sprint series and the endurance series and we're next up at Paul Ricard do you think you can repeat this performance for the next race and for the course of the championship itself yeah for sure is our goal but uh, we have to see because uh, uh, having different uh, different cars uh, even with uh, a custom BOP uh, can <laughs> we can have a, a little of differ differences between cars uh, in qualifying or in race, so we will see. But uh, for sure, we will we will aim to to win again in Portugal. Fantastic! Great start to the season for the Ferrari Driver Academy Esport team. David Tanitsa and Gianni Tosalvo, 25 points, championship lead, first time winners. Well done to the both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Ciao, ciao. Now, guys, great stuff there, Lewis. The brilliant end result for both of those two drivers and a great start to the season for the Ferrari team. And I believe we've got a new uh, second place man to talk to in the studio now. Uh, I believe we actually have third place finishing. We'll, we'll, we'll go back to Pash in just a moment. We've got Chris Urka, who's currently in with us. Just want to ask a very quick question. Battling with BRS Coanda Simsport, one of the biggest teams in sim racing. How was that for you? I'm still sweating like crazy, so that's how it was. Yeah, I mean, trading the thousands and the hundreds uh, of a second each lap uh, was quite uh, quite nerve wracking, to be honest. Yeah, so I'm just glad uh, we finally made it. Fantastic result, Chris, and a great strategic drive as well. Only managed to secure that podium position right towards the end of the race, comparatively speaking. How did the strategy play out for you? Did it go to plan or did you have to change some things as the race unfolded? Yeah, we changed a bit. At first, we uh, were thinking about going the long game. But we, we, we realized that uh, the 88 car seemed to struggle a little bit with uh, tire wear towards the end of the stint. Uh, so we were thinking of uh, on track it was very, very difficult uh, to pass as we were so close time-wise, uh, lap time-wise. So we thought let's do the undercut both times. Yeah? The first pit stop was already very, very, very close. I think we were 0.2 behind them after the first uh, pit stop. Uh, and then the second pit stop, uh, we came out, I think, four seconds uh, in front and we finished, I think, two seconds in front. So definitely the strategy uh, made P3 work here today. Absolutely. Superb stuff. And 18 points towards the championship challenge from the opening race. Next up, Paul Ricard. 
the Porsche seems like a competitive vehicle. Do you think you've got what it takes to fight at the very front once again in the next race at Paul Ricard on uh, June the 5th? I mean, we definitely hope so, obviously. Uh, I mean, we have a very, very long straight there, and for sure the Porsche will struggle a little bit there with the uh, ultimate uh, top speed. But I think we can make up ground in the uh, slower uh, corners, yeah, so definitely looking forward uh, to that one already. Fantastic stuff, Chris Herker. Great performance from yourself and the team. Third position and 15 points with it in the opening race of the season. So congratulations to GPX Racing by Ren Welton for that podium position. Well done. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Fantastic stuff. And uh, it was hard for Lewis, wasn't it? It certainly was. They did not get away easily battling it out with VRS Coranda Simsport. But uh, to the other car, there was a, a, a bit harder fighting up towards the front in the early stages. But Pash Gerges currently in the booth with us. Once got in the car, uh, just seemed like the pace of that Ferrari just really lit up and took off. Hey guys, that is it. Um, sadly, I when, I, when I was out of the car and I saw that... Uh, was, I was in the car, actually. When I saw David uh, overtaking me, I knew that... Um, I would probably not be able to uh, to match his pace. Uh, I knew it from the start, so we were hoping that Joshua could pull away a bit more and give me a, a buffer. It was not enough, but overall, um, I would say that I'm a bit um, disappointed with my overall performance, but given the fact that it was a really an emergency, I didn't know I would be racing 48 hours ago, and um, it was my first ever race in ACC, so to be second next to Josh is just uh, pretty good. and. Uh, he did a great effort, as as much as the the whole team, obviously, uh, the whole weekend yesterday in sprint, and uh, I'm sure uh, in the coming races you'll see more from us. I did kind of wonder this a little bit beforehand because we we know that VRS Commander Simsport are fairly new to a set of course of competency, and obviously that applies to yourself as well. How do you acclimatize to a a, a new sim that quickly? Firstly, it requires a lot of practice, I would say. That goes hand-to-hand. -hand. You can't really get that without a lot of effort. Um, and then it's all about getting the, um, the feel of the, of the game, how the handling reacts to getting used to the force feedback. And then you get more technical by uh, checking the force, uh, all the setup options, the control options. Uh, it's a process. I think most of the guys are acclimatized to that. And I'm sure everyone will get up to speed as well uh, from the whole team. Uh, I was overall happy, but um, I'm sure I'll try to get myself into some sprint races, get some more experience in, and uh, hopefully you'll see me again in the endurance races. Yeah, Pash, that's an absolutely incredible performance, considering it's your first ACC race. And 18 points at the end of the day is a very nice takeaway from this race. Now, do you think yourself and the team have got what you need to take the championship all the way through to the end of the season? No question. Uh, whether you look at our car, we have uh, Joshua, we have uh, Mark Bakum and Tommy Oscar, uh, very accomplished drivers, some of the best drivers in the world. And then if you look in the other car, we have Martin, Charlie and uh, Jeremy and all the crew, of course, behind us. Um, staff members who help us with uh, telemetry strategy, setting us up every everything that we need. Uh, the servers, the, all the little, uh, the rules, we are, they're keeping us up to date. So I think overall the whole team can have what it takes to definitely compete on the highest level on ACC. Well, fantastic. We're looking forward to seeing how that journey goes. And one final question before we say goodbye for the oh. evening. What does it, how, does, what, how much does it mean to race and be successful in a championship as prestigious as the GT World Challenge, the official Esports series, the endurance series, must be a good, a good feeling to be involved in events like this. Definitely, apart from the organisation, which has been, uh, and you guys in the broadcast have been great to listen and observe. Um, it is obvious uh, a sanctioned championship. We have all the the, ta the best talent gathered in this simulator, um, coming from all. Uh, aspects of sim racing and uh, the competition is just great. I mean, congrats to, I forgot to mention, congratulations to David and Giovanni. I mean, um, those guys are the best, um, one of the best in the, um, in the world as well. So it's it's big for us, apart from the challenge of acclimatizing in the simulator. Being here is very prestigious and uh, I hope we can have some more from that. Fantastic stuff, Pashka finish in 
third position, second position, sorry, in the opening round of the GT World Thank Challenge Esports Series. Congratulations, well done. We look forward to seeing you over the rest of the season. Likewise. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much. And a, a brilliant conclusion to a brilliant opening race of the year. At the start of the show, Lewis, we suggested this was going to be something quite crazy, quite exciting, and well, we were right. Absolutely. What a way to start the season. You talk of a couple of teams that are here to do one thing. I mean, everyone here is here to do one thing, and that is to win. But when you put the Ferrari Drivers Academy against the VRS Commander Simsport Squad, you've got something special. And we've seen the first stage of that, but the season is long. Any drivers that have come across various issues, whether it's through tyre wear, whether it's through pace drop off throughout a stint, for whatever reason, you need to sort those problems out. It is a race twice as long the next time we head to the circuit and that one being at Paul Ricard they've got to sort out their issues but boy oh boy regardless of that we seem to have a great fight on our hands we do indeed a pleasure as always to be commentating alongside you sir thank you everybody at home for watching the broadcast remember that the endurance series continues at Paul Ricard on the 5th of June for the six hours we've also got the Asia series the American series and the European sprint series as well on the GT world YouTube channel and of course we have got the Fanatec Pro series in Paul Ricard as well on the Saturday the 29th of this month so make sure to tune into that but from myself, Paul Jeffrey, from Lewis McGlade, from the whole team here at SRO Esports. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, we'll catch you then. Take care. Bye-bye.